the chat is also please do not post your your comments in the chat send those to the to the website and we are trying something a little bit new today with our timer we've been able to we're going to try to have a audio signal when your time is up so your timer will run for two minutes and then the audio signal will help you identify that your time is up and that's all i have for today okay thank you michelle um for the meeting today this is an important conservation and management plan that's been in the works for uh, at least a couple years and hundreds and hundreds of hours from people across a broad part of oregon have been involved um, tomorrow staff will provide an introductory overview of the plan and the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission will first consider key components of the plan individually and then move to considering approving the plan itself and the implementing rules as a whole. Today is a public hearing solely to hear testimony from the public about the Rogue South Coast plan. The Curry County Board of Commissioners set up a room at the county building so people could testify from there rather from their homes if they wanted to. There are about 150 people signed up to testify. So with such a big number, here's what we'll do today to both be fair to everyone who signed up and hear from this many people in a limited amount of time. Each person will have two minutes. And as Michelle mentioned, we did set up a bell so people will know when their time is up. I'm sorry we can't give people all the time that they would like to talk to us, but in order to get this many people heard today, we needed to, to make it two minutes. We take people in the order they signed up. And so the first approximate one hour will be people who signed up to testify um, through the Zoom system. And then we'll start alternating three people from the, from the county building and three people from the Zoom list. Um, we ask two things of everyone. The first is please focus your comments on what you want us to know to make decisions about this plan. We want to hear from you. This is an important chance to hear what everybody wants to tell us. We do ask that you skip any comments about others who are commenting and keep it to what you want us to know about the decisions we're going to make. We appreciate that you keep this respectful and we want to hear from everyone. It's a remarkable thing to have this level of interest in Oregon's fish and natural resources. And I thank all of you for the, the actually stunning level of effort and thought and passion that went into what we're gonna hear in the few minutes. So thank you again for being here and to all the staff for months and months of work to get where we are right now. As a courtesy to elected officials, we offer them the chance to testify first. So we'll start today with State Representative David Brock Smith, who is also my state representative. So Representative Brock Smith. While we're waiting for, for Representative Brock Smith, I'll mention who the next um, five people would be. Kirk Blaine, Shane Stalling, Dylan Renton, Stephen Mayer, and Alec Underwood. Represent representative, can you hear us? I can, Madam Commissioner. Thank you so much. We were just yeah. panelists switch over just took a minute and uh, <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, Commission. Um, State Representative David Brock Smith, House District 1, which encompasses everything from Charleston down to the Brookings Harbor, California border over to West Cape Junction up West I-5 to West Roseburg and then back over to uh, the bottom part of Coos Bay and East Side, and I and do have the pleasure of being the chair's uh, state representative, and appreciate her work on the commission. Appreciate all of your work uh, on the commission, and this important plan that uh, you're moving forward with today, and the opportunity for so many folks to speak to you about their thoughts on this plan. To that end, commissioners. Um, I hope that you, you know, as we move forward with the decisions that are going to, to occur, and everyone in Oregon, of course, has the right to have input on uh, what the South Coast plan is going to do, because everyone has the right to come and visit 
I do hope that you do take a little more weight into the testimonies from individuals that actually live and work and uh, call Curry County their home. Uh, they are conservationists at heart. They work to make sure that they're going to be a sustainable resource for generations to come. I, uh, I believe some of you know that, uh, that I uh, tried to move forward a ODFNW funding bill this last session so that we can have the resources to drive the, the data and science collection that is so, so necessary to make these decisions not just this decision, but of course, um, the sportsmen and women and wildlife management uh, of our resources across the state. Um, and so to that end, uh, you have a fantastic staff that has, uh, that has the experience and the dedication to give you these recommendations that are so critical for your decisions. And I would encourage you commissioners to listen to the staff, listen to their uh, recommendations and, uh, and follow them in your decision-making. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, representative, for being here with us today. Um, we'll go right to Kirk Blaine then. Um, go ahead. Chair Wall, commissioners, and Director Melcher. My name is Kirk Blaine. I'm the Southern Oregon Regional Coordinator for Native Fish Society, and I live in Roseburg. Native Fish Society asked the commission <laughs> to adopt alternative two catch and release angling for wild winter steelhead on decision 3.1. Over the past five years, local anglers, guides, and NGOs have been concerned about perceived declines in wild winter steelhead populations and the lack of data available to manage the fishery. In 2018 and 2019, the coalition carried petitions for catch and release for wild winter steelhead to the commission. Nearly 25,000 signatures were gathered in support. 2,000 of those were Oregon residents. As a result, the ODFW commission reduced bag limit and directed the department to create the RSP. In 2020, ODFW convened stakeholders to develop this, the plan. Despite the newly adopted ocean and climate change policy, climate change was not covered in a robust way during this process. This summer, ODFW released the public draft of the RSP for review and comment. 88% of the comments were in favor of adopting catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead. On October 1st, ODFW released a commission draft for the RSP. Despite overwhelming public support, ODFW staff eliminated the catch and release alternative. ODFW staff has since added alternatives back to the plan. Since October 15th, ODFW has received close to 1,300 comments supporting alternative two, catch and release for wild winter steelhead on decision 3.1. Today, folks will share with you their concerns about wild winter steelhead and the lack of data being used to inform this plan. This plan makes numerous assumptions and the data included has very high uncertainty. Commissioners, the decisions ahead of you tomorrow are a great opportunity for wild fish. Your decisions will be a bellwether for how Oregon will proceed in managing wild fish in a changing climate. Please take action for our fish and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Shane Stalling. Hi, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. Thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Shane Stalling. I'm a South Coast resident and an angler in Coos Bay, Oregon. I'd like to use some of my time today to revisit a question that was asked in the October 25th commissioners meeting. To paraphrase it, there's been a lot of concern about steelhead population, and we know there are problems in the Columbia River and other areas. So is my understanding correct that on the South Coast, all indications point to no problem? I really respect all the work ODFW staff does to monitor and manage native fish. So the leading nature of that question was upsetting to me. Leading questions do not allow the ODFW staff to give fair answers. So the data reference did paint a pretty picture, sure, but it only referenced juvenile counts, historical spawning surveys, and a few snorkeling trips where fish were seen. What picture gets painted if we had data for adult fish populations? The historic spawning surveys reference don't do monitoring any good if they aren't compared with current up-to-date spawning surveys. So if I may answer the above question based on ODFW data, do all indications on the South Coast point to no problem? Absolutely not. In fact, the Rogan South Coast has seen the lowest number of juveniles on record for the past six years as found in the 2021 ODFW monitoring report. That sounds like a problem to me and is consistent with the downward trends seen all along the Pacific Coast. A reminder that the AG stated, the commission and agency's overriding obligation is to protect the resource from being over-harvested. And commissioners should be confident 
that any fishery they sanction will not be over harvesting native fish species. So please do what the state of has asked of you. Stop allowing the depletion of native stocks by harvest. Because when you don't know how many adult fish are in the systems, it's impossible to, to be confident, only wishful. So when making your decision tomorrow, please do what was asked of you by the state and protect our native resources. Option two, catch and release wild steelhead. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Dylan Renton. Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dylan Renton, and along with my family, I operate Renton River Adventures. In the previous decade, I've explored, fished, and guided the rivers of central and southern coastal Oregon for winter steelhead. Myself and my clientele spend money every year in various towns, supporting lodging, restaurants, and other community businesses. The October draft of the Rogue South Coast Management Plan concerns me that it lacks the population estimates, survival rates, and sustainable harvest models needed to support a fishery allowing wild retention. In the face of historically low steelhead returns across the west coast of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, it is the wrong time to consider whether wild retention is appropriate in any, cons <clears throat> any conservation plan. Furthermore, with hatchery programs in place, harvest opportunities still exist in rivers across the southern coast. This year, I saw a drastic alteration in my business both on the North Umpqua River and the Deschutes River, when low returns of seal had resulted in the closure of the recreational fishery. Guides such as myself lost months worth of income and lost the opportunity to share the rivers we love with clients. Clients who bring revenue to both our businesses as well as the communities we guide around. Wild seal are too valuable to the future of the Southern Coastal Rivers and are an investment into the future of all guide services. Harvesting them may in fact lead to higher likelihood that more rivers in the Southern Coast region will see closures due to low returns. This is not a future I wish to see for anglers or guides alike. I request that the commission direct the department to adopt catch and release for wild sealhead as a result of these and other concerns. When sealhead populations continue to trend and decline, and there is a lack of data, wild retentions should not be, should not be within the management plan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I hope ODF and W will ratify catch and release for the next five years in the RSP, and then there's commitment to the health of wild seal and fisheries and the communities that rely on them. Thank you, Dylan. And Stephen, just before I call on you, let me tell you who the um, next group would be. Um, um, Dax Messet, Mike Brinkley, Matthew Sloat, Mark Sherwood, Will Johnson. So we'll go right back to you, um, Stephen, if you will. Good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. My name is Stephen Marr. I live in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm an architect, an angler, and the incoming president of the Oregon Council of Fly Fishers International. The Oregon Council is a nonprofit organization whose membership comprises of anglers who care deeply about our state's waters and especially the native fish populations, such as the southwestern steelhead. The FFI supports catch and release regulations using single barbless hooks and artificial flies or lures only in the RSP management area until adequate monitoring is in place and fisheries managers are confident that harvest can be implemented sustainably. The current data set is insufficient. There are not any adult spawning surveys conducted in the Rogue Basin this year, the PHAS is unknown, and there are no adult estimates for the South Coast watersheds. Fisheries managers throughout the Pacific Northwest have moved to catch and release regulations to help boost adult steelhead escapement. This is an effective management tool that still provides fishing opportunities. We must implement precautionary management until adequate data is collected and monitoring is instituted. The primary data set for population monitoring is for juveniles, which is inadequate for monitoring adults. And considering the past six years have shown a steady decline for juveniles, harvest is too risky for our wild steelhead populations. Hatchery steelhead can and should be harvested to fulfill that opportunity. 89% of wild harvest already occurs in the Rogue and Chetco rivers, which are streams with an abundance of hatchery fish. The Oregon Council encourages the commission to implement rigorous monitoring, similar to what has been adopted successfully in Idaho and Washington, to better understand the state of our wild Oregon steelhead populations and make more informed decisions. Considering this year's historic low return on steelhead across the state, we believe the current harvest regulations in this region only contributes to the undeniable decline of wild winter steelhead. We want to support ODFW and other stakeholders to prevent their further decline or extinction. Therefore, the Oregon Council asks the commission to adopt alternative two, catch and release angling regulations for winter steelhead and the Rogue South Coast Multi-Species Conservation Management Plan. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to testify today. Happy holidays. Thank you, Stephen. Let's go next to Alec Underwood. 
Chair Wall, Alec Underwood is not on the meeting at this time. Thank you. Then let's go to Dax Messett. I saw his name. I think it's a, I saw that name pop up. Still muted though. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Chair Wall, Commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, today for me and everybody else to testify um, on the situation on the Southwest Coast. Um, my name's Dax Messett. I've been a, a fishing guide for over 20 years now. Um, I guide in multiple states and take folks to multiple places around the world to go fishing. And um, those are based on opportunities. And um, I feel that we should adopt um, catch and release reg regulations for the South Coast. Um, and when I hear uh, 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 opponents of catch and release, they, they talk a lot about opportunity. And what I know about opportunities in all the places that I travel is that closures and restrictions of rivers um, that are having issues takes away the opportunity for everybody, not just the way certain people fish and certain regulations when a fishery is closed, like we have um, that happened on the Skeena River this year that we had happen um, with closures and restrictions on the Olympic Peninsula where I've guided a lot in the past, um, the North Umpqua River, Columbia tributaries. Um, when the situation happens where steelhead um, are in enough trouble that we have to close and restrict these fisheries, it takes away the opportunity for everybody. And um, my business generates anywhere from Twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month on these fisheries that I go and 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 operate my businesses on, and um, there's a lot more people than me doing it. So um, the people of Curry County and the other um, towns that are affected economically um, by the fishery being healthy, I think if we're able to keep the fishery open um, and still have everybody a chance to participate, um, we'll still have the opportunities and the benefits both the steelhead in the long term and the economic impacts of the communities in which these beautiful rivers are. Thanks again, and all for catch and release. Thank you. Thank you, Dex. Mike Brinkley. My name is Mike Brinkley, Conservation Director of the Oregon Council of Five Fishers International. On behalf of this organization, I'm thanking you for considering modifications to the proposed RSP. Recognizing the need to protect wild steelhead, the South Coast RSP needs to be changed to prevent harvest of wild steelhead while allowing a controlled harvest of the hatchery origin fish in these rivers. One of the most obvious reasons for a no harvest rule for wild steelhead is the current lack of knowledge of the fishery. Until there are population estimates for adult steelhead, knowledge of harvest rates, and the percentage of hatchery fish on the spawning grounds, otherwise known as PHOS, how can the agency continue to allow wild harvest? There is just simply a lack of information required to make an informed decision on whether the practice is really sustainable. This year, we're seeing the lowest returns of wild steelhead in West Coast rivers in the last 43 years. Common sense precautions should be taken to ensure against further damage to these struggling fish until sufficient data is obtained to justify any harvest of wild fish. There are good sustainable populations of hatchery steelhead in the Rogue and Chetco to supply any harvest needs to support the anglers, the guides, and the economy of the fishery and of the region. I and the organization that I represent respectfully ask you to change the rules and move to catch and release and uh, regulations for all wild steelhead in the Rogue South Coast Multi-Species Conservation Management Plan. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for testifying, Mike. Um, Matthew Sloat. Good morning, Chair Wall and members of the commission. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Matthew Sloat and I'm the Science Director for Wild Salmon Center. My background includes a PhD in fishery science from Oregon State University. And as a scientist with expertise in climate impacts to fisheries, I'm speaking today to ask the commission to adopt plan alternatives that will help reduce the risks that climate change poses for Oregon's fish populations. 
Climate change is driving unpredictable changes in the ocean and freshwater systems and reducing the productivity of salmon and steelhead populations. And steelhead populations across the West Coast from British Columbia to Oregon, as we've heard, have collapsed this year as a result, forcing emergency fisheries closures in West Coast states and provinces. And rural communities that depend on fishing tourism have been hit hard by this disaster. We only know the full magnitude of the steelhead population collapse in rivers that have good adult steelhead monitoring programs, but the collapse that has been documented by monitoring is also occurring in unmonitored populations up and down the west coast, and this includes many of the rivers covered by this plan, for which we have very limited information on adult abundance. Climate change is affecting nearly all of these populations in similar ways because of a coast-wide prolonged drought, reducing freshwater productivity, and conditions in the ocean where steelhead spend about half of their life uh, are also changing rapidly. The majority of West Coast steelhead populations migrate to the same areas of the North Pacific and these areas are warming substantially, reducing the area available to steelhead. And that means that steelhead populations are not going to be able to support the level of harvest that they might have in the past. The plan contains two elements the wild fish emphasis areas and catch and release measures that have alternatives that can provide the best chance for wild and healthy fish stocks to get through the current climate crisis. As the commission considers alternatives for wild fish emphasis areas, I urge you to adopt alternative one, which applies these designations to all salmon species, including Chinook. And when considering interim harvest alternatives, I urge the commission to adopt alternative two, the catch and release measures for wild steelhead for the five year interim period this common sense alternative will ensure that ODFW has time to gather the minimum, minimum necessary data to determine whether or not wild populations can sustain harvest, given the grave challenges posed by climate change. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Matthew. And just before we go to the next speaker, the, ne the five after our next two are Stuart Warren, Charles Gere, Zick Rich um, Zellman, Adam Manilin, Tim Goforth. So let's go to Mark Sherwood. Good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. My name is Mark Sherwood. I'm the Executive Director of the Native Fish Society, and I call Curry County my home. Thank you for your time today. We can have a future in Southwest Oregon with abundant wild fish, healthy rivers, and thriving local communities if we recognize there's a problem, and if the rogue South Coast plan propels actions now to steward wild fish in the face of a changing climate. We understand that many of you are leaning towards alternatives that we're concerned about. We ask that you remain open to the testimony that you hear today. We support the sustainable harvest of wild fish. What we are against is the unsustainable harvest of any wild fish, especially wild steelhead. Continuing to kill wild steelhead without knowing how many fish are returning to Southwest Oregon's rivers is not sound stewardship. If you cannot say with confidence that the one in three wild steelhead harvest fishery can be maintained for generations to come, you should, in, you should not endorse it now. This is why we support decision 3.1, alternative two, catch and release over the next five years. We are confident it is a sustainable alternative that will safeguard our wild fish, keep the fishery open to allow the harvest of hatchery fish, while we collect the adult uh, steelhead data we need to sustainably fish in the future. Commissioners, in decision one, please adopt alternative one and amend the map to remove the mixed emphasis area in the Winchuck River. In 2013, stakeholders in the commission designated rivers for important wild Chinook salmon populations, which included the Winchuck River. It is not the role of rogue South Coast stakeholders to change the management of fall Chinook salmon by adding a new hatchery program to these wild fish rivers. So again, I'm asking, for decision one, please adopt alternative one and remove the Winshock River's mixed emphasis area. Commissioners, the decisions you will make tomorrow will be a bellwether for how Oregon will manage wild fish in a changing climate. Please take action for fish and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. The next person on the list is Will Johnson um, and then Stuart. Michelle, is Will available? Will is in the meeting room. Um, he just needs to unmute his microphone. Will Johnson, go ahead and unmute and we'll listen to you. I should be unmuted. Yes, thank you. Am I there? Yes. 
Great. My name is Will Johnson. I own the Ashland Fly Shop in Ashland, Oregon. Uh, we've been there about 15 years and um, we book uh, close to two, 300 uh, guided uh, fishing trips for steelhead um, on the Rogue River and in the region um, annually and see a lot of folks uh, come through our region and to the south coast to, to fish for steelhead. Um, Chairman Wall, I appreciate uh, the opportunity and commissioners. Um, I'm, it's just so wonderful to listen to this testimony. I, I'm just, un, it's, it's amazing that we're having this conversation uh, uh, for, for Wild Steelhead. The, the, the part that, that we're kind of hedging our bets on, um, on hatchery and, and continuing to allow even the limited uh, uh, harvest of uh, wild steelhead at this time is, 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 is truly wild. To go, to go back, you know, to go back and undo that um, once the numbers are so low that there we have uh, such a difficulty to recover them, uh, I, I think just is is really uh, surprising. So I, I'm in I'm in support for sure of uh, complete um, uh, ban on the harvest of of wild uh, steelhead. Um, absolutely in in uh, in the region that we're talking about today, and I think it's 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 absolutely proven that we will still see uh, angling community um, in, in great numbers and with, with, uh, economic opportunity in the region with catch and release, uh, wild steelhead that's proven up and down the Pacific Northwest. So, um, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk today and, uh, thank you very much commissioners. Um, thank you, Will. Um, we'll go to Stuart, and then I think there was one um, change that I missed. Brett Brownscombe was on the list. I didn't call his name because he had yielded his time to Guido Rare, and I didn't pick that up, but I see that he's here, so we will go ahead and hear him. But first, we'll hear Stuart, and then we'll go back to Guido Rare, and then go right through the other um, Charles Gear, Rich Zellman, Adam Manolin, and Tim Goforth. So, Stuart, go ahead. Good morning, Chair Wall and Commission members. Thank you for this opportunity for us to speak today. It is great to see so much interest from the general public and their engagement in this important topic. I live in Jackson County and have worked for the last 12 years as a fishing guide in the Upper Rogue. I submitted my comments to you in writing, so I'll keep this brief. I ask that you adopt the Rogue South Coast plan with alternative two catch and release for wild winter steelhead. I believe it's the proactive, cautious approach for properly managing our fisheries that will keep our guides working and our anglers fishing. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Stuart. Guido Rare. I think you need to unmute yourself, Guido. But okay, here we go. Uh, Chair Wall, members of the commission. Thank you very much for the chance to testify. My name is Guido Rar. I'm the uh, president of the Wild Salmon Center. Uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon, and we have a staff and partners in Southwest Oregon. Um, I would like to say our comments on the plan mirror those described by uh, Trout Unlimited and Native Fish Society, but I wanted to emphasize the importance of the designation and the application of the portfolio approach to Southwest Oregon. Uh, Oregon's unique that we have such a strong collection of wild salmon runs. And if we go south into California or north into Washington state, it's a different picture. So this is a tremendous opportunity for us as a state. And I support the department's approach to basically looking at the at a portfolio approach that sets, a, sets firm conservation goals for the wild fish and also recognizes the role of the hatchery system. And th this is a, you know, we participated on the North Coast process. Uh, there were painful concessions made, but it worked out and, it, and we like where we ended up for the most part. Now we've gone through the same process on the South Coast and I think it's a tremendous opportunity. And so we support uh, the department's recommendation on alternative one, uh, decision one, to uh, support uh, the wild fish emphasis areas, but we also recognize the importance of the wind chuck should be managed as a wild fish area and not a mixed emphasis area. And what this will do will, will enable us to protect the wild populations and the genetic and life history diversity that we're really gonna need uh, as we move into the future with more demands upon the fish, the habitat, and the impacts of climate change. So uh, thank you for the chance to testify and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Guido. 
Um, Charles Gear. Uh, good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> My name is Charles Gear, and I was a stakeholder in the RS in the development of the RSP. I'm a Jackson County resident with annual Oregon hunting and fishing licenses, and I own a company that builds fishing rods here. Regarding decision one before this commission, the options presented in this plan do not reflect the intent of what was asked. Most agree that there's no need to include potential future Chinook hatchery programs in this plan, a plan which doesn't address Chinook in any other area. Yet to remove those possible hatchery programs from the Winchuck and Euchre Creek means that there's no wild fish emphasis area protections for Chinook anywhere in the Southwest zone. This clearly goes against the established Chinook management plans in place and should be reworked so as to be consistent with those plans. I ask this commission to take alternative two on decision two. ODFW has credited the success of wild coastal coho to eliminating harvest and decreasing or eliminating hatchery inputs. There's no justification for increasing hatchery releases just because that number was released in the past. I ask that this commission establish catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead for a period of five years. After five years of monitoring data that includes adult population estimates, escapement goals, and expected fishery mortality, the department should then determine if a harvest fishery is viable and sustainable. Commissioners, climate change is happening right now. It's happening now and we don't know how bad conditions might get or for how long. We're asking for you to be absolutely certain wild harvest is merited. We have robust hatchery programs, so there's plenty of opportunity to harvest. Why not be conservative with wild fish that are under your department's charge and we all know are the most adept at dealing with varied climate change based impacts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charles. Rich Zellman. Hi, commissioners. Thanks for taking the time to listen to our comments today. Um, I'm a fishing guide in Southern Oregon and in Northern California, and I'm in support of catch and release of wild steelhead in the South Coast zone. <clears throat> One reason is because there's five hatcheries in Southern Oregon that offer ample angler harvest opportunities. Chetco, Rogue, Applegate, um, Coquille, and South Umpqua. And I think we can all agree on that last year's winter run was one of the worst we've ever seen, even though ODF and W's small counts and half pounder counts pointed to a strong return, which just shows we don't really know what's happening out there in the ocean. Um, and there's been unprecedented closures on some of Oregon's most iconic rivers. One that I guide, the North Umpqua, that really um, affected my business for a few months where I couldn't, couldn't guide it. And every business is going to be affected, <clears throat> motels, restaurants, everything, if the South Coast runs continue to decline and we have to go to closure closures. Um, I also guide... Um, in Northern California on California Smith River, which closed to wild steelhead harvest in 2011. And the pressure there, as far as anglers go, has only increased. It hasn't decreased at all. People are out there to catch fish, um, whether they can kill them or not. Um, and I just think, you know, the writing is on the wall right now. And if we can't, if we don't see it now, when will we? And it'll be too late by the time we do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rich. Adam Manolin. Chair Wall, Adam is not in the meeting at this moment. Tim, go forth. Thanks, Michelle. Chair Wall, commissioners, and Director Melcher. My name is Tim Goforth. I am a steel header. I was a long-term resident on the North Umpqua River where I lost our 80 acre ranch, livestock, and home to the Archie Creek fire, and now reside in Waldport, Oregon. I'm testing today to share my immediate concern for wild steelhead in the Pacific Northwest, urging the department to implement a conservative approach to management. For 30 years, I have been involved in conservation of wild steelhead on the North Umpqua River. In 2014, during the adoption of the Coastal Management Species Conservation Plan, guides, anglers, and stakeholders asked commissioners to adopt catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead in the Umpqua Basin. Guides and advocates realized they wanted more fish spawning, creating offspring and more opportunities for their clients to catch fish. 
The commission listened and adopted catch and release regulations. In 2019, 2020, winter steelhead season, the North Umpqua River saw over 10,000 wild winter steelhead. We are seeing more fish now than when the wild steelhead harvest was allowed, creating more opportunities for anglers. Some asked the questions, did license sales go down or fewer people come to fish? That is wrong. We have more people coming to fish to Umpqua than ever before. More trailers and boat at the boat ramps than ever before. Bait lure and license sales continue to thrive. In the North Umpqua Basin, we learned just how important it is to be con conservative with our fish. We saw the worst summer steelhead run on record this year. As you are aware, the river was closed until December 1st. The, the future of North Umpqua River steelhead is uncertain. Don't let that happen in Southern Oregon. That's why I urge you to take caution, plan ahead and adopt alternative two, catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead in the RSP. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Tim. Um, the next five are Stephen Scow, Nicholas Reiser, Craig Zarling, Paul Stenberg, Chris Dodders, and we'll start with Stephen Scow. Sure, while Stephen Scow is not in the room at the moment. Then Nicholas Reiser. Nicholas Reiser is also not in the room. Craig Zarling, I see that name. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having a chance to say something about this. I'm just checking. I don't see my image on there. I'm checking to be sure you can hear me. We can hear you well. We can't see you. OK, let me see if I can. All right, I think I'm there. Yes, go ahead. OK. Well, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and, and uh, I moved to Oregon in 1990, actually because of the steelhead. And I've been getting my boots wet in Oregon <clears throat> rivers since then, the Deschutes, of course. Uh, I go down and fish the Rogue almost every year. Um, and I, usually I, I'm in the, in the Wilson River and getting my boots wet there every Sunday during the season. I'm here to really advocate for the idea and the value of wildness in Oregon. Uh, to experience an intact ecosystem is amazing. Uh, the analogy I would draw would be uh, to elk hunting. Uh, people going out to hunt elk, they're looking to have the experience of interacting with something that's wild, uh, beautiful, and really part of an intact system. Um, the neat thing about wild steelhead fishing is you can turn them loose after you're done and they're still alive. Um, probably like a lot of people, I've noticed the reduction in the past 30 years of wild fish in the Wilson River uh, in winter. Um, and, and it has me concerned. And like many people who've spoken, uh, I just can't help but think that that might be a generalizable thing on the West Coast. Uh, and, and so I think that our wild steelhead are treasures and we should treat them like that uh, and protect them. Uh, and so I'm here to advocate for the catch and release uh, option, especially while we're studying uh, where our wild fish populations in the South Coast are. Uh, once we have that data, then I think we can make informed decisions. Let's be careful in the meantime. Thank you, Craig. Um, Paul Stenberg, Paula Stenberg, sorry. Paula? Um, I'll tell you the next five names after these two um, and then we'll come back to Paula. Nick Chambers, Michael Farrar, Tom Derry, Katie Falkenberg and Leonard Krug. Um, so do we have Paula? Um, Chair Wall, we do have Paula and the attendees. I think I was, her name was not moving over. I believe that it just made that transition for us. She's in the room now. Okay, thank you. Paula, go ahead. 
Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. Can you hear me, please? Yes. You, okay. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Paula Stenberg. I'm a retired research scientist. Although I reside in Portland, I lived in the Rogue Valley for 18 years. I learned to fly fish on the beautiful Rogue River and the coastal rivers, and have since returned many times to these rivers, my natal streams. I'm deeply concerned about winter steelhead in Southern Oregon. These beloved iconic fish are facing so many threats to their existence, including assaults from climate change, habitat loss and fisheries. The draft recommendations of the Rogue South Coast Conservation Management Plan which do not contain sufficient population estimates, mortality and harvest rates are too uncertain and are fraught with risk to native wild steelhead in this region. What I would like to request is that the commission support catch and release regulations until adequate adult monitoring is instituted. Such fundamental monitoring should be implemented before allowing the harvest of state game and fish species. ODFW management actions should be made with science-driven knowledge of adult population estimates and expected fisheries mortality of wild winter steelhead. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to the adoption of catch and release regulations for these native fish for the first five years of the RSP or until sufficient data is collected to make sustainable harvest decisions. I would like my little granddaughter to be able to follow in my wading boots and one day cast a fly line into these rivers I love and to celebrate with me that native wild steelhead are alive and well for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Michelle, I don't know if it's possible to publish or put the list up on the website of the roster for today's testimony, but we did have a request that it be put up so people can see when their name comes up. Um, we'll go to Chris Daughters. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioners. Um, my name is Chris Daughters. I'm a fishing guide and owner of the Caddis Fly Angling Shop in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, my business is very much reliant on um, wild fish in Oregon. Uh, our business reaches uh, the entire state and, and beyond. Um, and I ask that you adopt the alternative to catch and release uh, for wild winter steelhead without current adult harvest monitoring, adult mortality, or adequate adult escapement multiple generation, for multiple generations. ODFW does not know the total impact of harvest on wild winter steelhead as a result of direct harvest and catch and release angling. I request the commission direct the department to change regulations to catch and release for wild winter steelhead on the Rogue and South Coast until a five year review of adequate monitoring data is available to inform harvest management. Um, I think we have some incredible examples of successful catch and release fisheries. The main stem of the Umpqua River, for example, is a worldwide draw as the South Coast has a unique steelhead and salmon run of fish that people revere worldwide. Protecting that is absolutely critical. As managers, uh, you can retain the opportunity uh, through catch and release. Angling opportunity uh, is, is immense in Southern Oregon and it's really such an incredibly valuable resource that, that doing anything other than adopting catch and release for this fishery at this time without the data, I believe is negligent. I urge you to eliminate the harvest of wild fish until adequate monitoring could be done. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Chris. Nick Chambers. Go ahead, Nick. Michelle, could we move to Michael Farrar then while we wait for Nick to come on? I don't have Michael in the room. We could go to um... Tom Derry. 
Tom Derry is in the room. Okay, and then, then we'll go back to Nick Chambers as soon as um, Tom is finished and then Katie Falkenberg and Leonard Krug. So go ahead, Tom. Okay, I figured it out. I'm not very good at these things. Chair Wall, commissioners and Director Melcher, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Tom Derry. I live in Malala, Oregon, and am a license holder in the state of Oregon. I am also a lifelong native Oregonian. ODFW staff is telling you they don't know how many wild steelhead there are in Southern Oregon. The country is just too rugged for accurate red counts. I ask you, can we have too many wild steelhead when there are so few everywhere else? We saw great steelhead rivers like the Deschutes and John Day, Umpqua closed to fishing because of record low numbers in 2021. Former governor and wild fish advocate Tom McCall would be heartbroken if he knew the state of wild steelhead in his Oregon. I'm heartbroken as well. The state of Oregon spends $50 million a year. That's $50 million a year on put and take hatchery programs. These programs should provide more than enough opportunity for fish to kill if an angler chooses to do so. I'm asking you to please stop the kill of wild steelhead in Southern Oregon before it's too late. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. We'll go back to Nick Chambers. Um, let's go to Katie Falkenberg. Um, well, and then we'll try one more time for Nick, Ch Nick Chambers. Good Go morning. Good morning and thank you for your time. I'm a photographer and filmmaker based in the Rogue Valley. I was working as a photojournalist for the Los Angeles Times four years ago when I came here to Southern Oregon for the first time to do a story on the North Umpqua River. I had been fishing on trout streams back east with my dad since I was younger and I felt right at home in the mountains of Oregon. I fell in love with the rivers in this area as well as the wild fish that swim in them. Two years later, I made the move here. What we have here is incredibly special, but as we saw this summer, also incredibly fragile. It's frightening to me that what brought me here in the first place seems to be slipping away. This past summer, we were forced to face the reality of climate change in this area. Rivers and reservoirs were at record lows, water temperatures at record highs, and extreme wildfires burning right to the edge of our iconic steelhead rivers. From Oregon to BC, we've seen river closures due to low steelhead returns. It seems unfathomable to me that at such a time we are debating whether we should continue killing wild steelhead, especially when we have hatchery programs in place. At a time when we are faced with the uncertainties brought about by climate change, and until we have a better grasp of the true number of wild steelhead returning each winter, I think we need to manage these special resources carefully. Don't we want to be absolutely certain that we have done everything we can to make sure we still have wild steelhead in our rivers, not only for us, but for the next generations? There's just too much at stake to disregard the numbers and the science and not move forward choosing to manage these rivers with caution. This one decision could imperil the future of the existence of wild steelhead in these rivers. Why risk that? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, Nick Chambers. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, and sorry for the delay there. Um, so first, I just wanna thank all the commissioners for your thoughtful consideration of everything that's at hand today and for taking the time to listen to this large amount of testimony. Um, as you noted, Mary, it's very unusual for this many people to show up to testify. And I think that interest is in large part sparked by the fact that we're seeing region-wide declines in wild steelhead, and we've seen closure after closure and reductions in the number of places we can fish really for the last two decades. And as a whole, I know a lot of steelhead fishermen are extremely concerned about our opportunity to continue to fish for the long term. And sometimes it's necessary to take a short term sacrifice in order to ensure our opportunity to fish for the long term. 
And I have a different elk analogy for you, actually. And I think it's a good example um, where elk hunting was actually closed in Oregon from 1909 to 1932 because we hunted them to the brink of extinction. And we gave them a 23 year break. And now we never have to worry about whether or not we're going to be able to go elk hunting in the fall. And I don't think we're in the same situation with South Coast Steelhead where we're on the brink of extinction. But um, at the same time, we've never given these fish a break from to recover from this same um, period of over harvest that occurred historically. And, you know, the, the counts at Gold Ray Dam absolutely do not show that we've had stable run sizes of wild steelhead for the past 70 years, as I often hear said. All they're really telling us is how many fish survived the fishery to get to that point 130 miles in stream. And by most accounts, harvest rates and abundance of wild fish has declined significantly during this time. And in my personal experience, and I know many of that, that of many others on the call here today, um, there are more people and fewer fish than there were even just 20 to 25 years ago. And so while there's a huge amount of uncertainty, there are many reasons to be concerned about the trends of wild steel on the South Coast. And for that reason, I ask that you support catch and release for the next five years. Um, and I also ask for your continued interest in this issue to ensure that all these outstanding questions that many of us have, and I'm sure many of you have, um, are answered in this five-year period so that we can move forward with the best management plan possible. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Nick. Our next um, person is Leonard Krug. And then after Leonard would be Barbara Spanny, John Anderson, Landon Mace, Lauren Angel, and Richard Harrington. So Leonard Krug. Hear me okay? Go ahead. Yes. I'm broadcasting from the Curry County Commission Chambers and we just seconds ago got the IT person to get us uh, streaming live. Now, are you ready to go to the Curry County Forum? That's where I was scheduled to testify from. Yes, and and actually, I just got crosswise with my own um, process. So once we start with, now that we have the county um, up and going, we'll do three from the county building and then three from the um, Zoom. So it would be um, you, Leonard, Barbara Spanny, and John Anderson, and then we'll go to three from Zoom, which would be Landon Mace, Lauren Angel, and Richard Harrington. So yes, we will take three people from the county. Go ahead, Leonard. Barbara, what was that last name? S-P-A-N-I, -S I'm saying it's Spanny. I hope I have it right. All right. Good morning, commissioners and chair. Well, my name is Leonard Krug and I'm a stakeholder on the RSP. I currently serve as the executive director of the Oregon South Coast Fishermen and as the president of the Ang Oregon Anglers Alliance. But more importantly, I'm a longtime salmon trout enhancement program volunteer. Now we as step volunteers live and work year round on these coastal streams. When we're not fishing, we're organizing river cleanups, picking up garbage and hauling it to the dump. We also conduct year round habitat research and monitoring projects on these streams. And in the late summer, when these streams dry up to a fraction of their winter flows, you can always find some of us patrolling the low water channels and pools, rescuing the small fry and the smolt that have become trapped by the low water and releasing them back into the river so that they can continue their migration back to the ocean. Step volunteers understand and care about these things. Our lives depend on them. Our communities revolve around them. ODFW opinion and data clearly demonstrate the viability of these fish is in no way threatened. As the old saying goes, don't try and fix it if it isn't broken. So I need to let you know that the South Coast community, the OAA and the step volunteers absolutely support having a choice when it comes to harvest of winter steelhead. Please continue to allow the harvest of wild winter steelhead. After more than two years, we still have issues with this plan but it's time to move on. In closing, I'd like to ask the commission to trust the voices of the community. Please trust the opinion of ODFW staff, majority of the stakeholders and all of the staff volunteers. Please continue to follow our successful proven traditional model of conservation and unanimously accept the plan as it is proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Um, Barbara Spanny. Barbara.
Yeah, I don't know if there's anything we can do, but the volume is definitely not very good on on uh, what I'm hearing here anyway. Right now, the Curry County um, Courthouse microphone is muted. You will need to be unmuted, please. There we go. Did you guys hear Leonard? There you go. We did hear Leonard, yes. And if Barbara Spanny is ready, or we can go to John Anderson. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I would like to uh, let you know that uh, my husband and I, and we are both volunteers with the Korean Anthropist Fishermen, and um, we're very concerned um, for, for uh, the harvesting of the winter steelhead. And um, we would like to let you know that we put our faith in the work that the ODFW staff and the stakeholders have done over the last two years to come up with this uh, comprehensive plan. Um, I encourage the commission to trust the majority of stakeholders and ODFW staff's opinion and accept this plan with a unanimous vote. Um, please follow our proven successful traditional model of conservation. Uh, we are the people that work and live in these streams year on these streams year round, and no one holds these fish in a higher regard than we do. Um, we have and will continue to safeguard them for our future generation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Barbara. John Anderson, and then we'll go to Landon Mace, Lauren Angel, and Richard Harrington. So John, go ahead. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Commissioners, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I know you're being put in a difficult spot here to make a decision that affects a lot of lives. You know, I've worked hard for 19 years building my guide business and I do between 35 and 40 trips. So the decisions you make will definitely affect the coastal communities. Most of my clients show up, take at least one or two rooms uh, a night and they stay for two and three days at a time and go to our restaurants and buy fuel. So it will be an economic uh, impact uh, if you decide to choose to not pay attention to the biologist's uh, report. But before I did this, I did fish and stream rehabilitation. I had a company called Anderson's Fish and Stream Rehabilitation, and I would do habitat work, I moved the Wood River in this historic channel for Oregon trout. And uh, also belonged to the STEP program and had six X incubators going in the classrooms in Klamath Falls. And uh, here on the coast, I've helped pull the nets uh, at, forget, brood stock for our hatchery. And the uh, hatchery then would take the wild fish and they would raise them up and release them at six to seven inches long. And in the wild, they hatch out as fry and they, everything eats them. They're so small, they're an inch and a half long. But if you raise those fish up to where they're a little bigger and turn them loose, they can have a better survival rate against the predators. And uh, since they're wild stock in the beginning, how do you change the DNA? It doesn't. So all we're doing is just helping mother nature along the way with our hatchery fish. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, John. Landon, Commissioner's Honor. Yeah, if they could, the people at the courthouse, if when they're first starting to talk, could they identify themselves too? Good point. Thank sure. you. Go ahead, Landon. Thank you. Chair Wall, Director Melcher, and Commissioners, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Landon Mace, and I am a general manager and guide for Confluence Fly Shop and Deep Canyon Outfitters in Bend, Oregon. I've submitted my written testimony and would like to keep this short for you all today. What I would like to touch on, however, is the economic effects that I have witnessed firsthand in Central Oregon. As you all know, we have most of our rivers in our area closed to fishing for steelhead this year. We lost the Deschutes, the John Day, North Umpqua, amongst a few others. With that, I saw the impact that it played in both retail 
store and our guide service. We significantly lost sales and for steelhead specific items that are sold in the store. And we saw the loss in our guided trips for individuals that wanted to only target these specific fish. I'm hopeful for change in years to come. In conclusion, I fully support catch and release of wild steelhead in our beautiful state of Oregon. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Landon. Um, Lauren, Lauren Angel. Chair Wall, I don't have Lauren in the meeting at this moment. Richard Harrington. Am I there? Yes. We can hear dear, you. Dear Chair Wall, Director Melcher and Commissioners, my name is Richard Harrington. I live up in Oregon City and I spend a considerable amount of time on Southern Oregon rivers. My son and I produced the River Rambler podcast. We've been fortunate to have conversations with some of the leading fishery scientists and conservationists dealing with wild steelhead and salmon. And it is good clear through these conversations that good science relies on good data. As steelhead populations collapse across the Pacific Northwest, it seems inappropriate to continue to kill wild fish in any river without the knowledge that the population is stable and will continue to be so. Please adopt an alternative to remove harvest of wild fish from the regulations for the Southern Oregon rivers until such time we have strong and complete data on which to base those regulations. Thank you so much for your time and consideration in the work that you do. Thank you, Richard. We'll go to the courthouse for three more people. And if they can each introduce themselves as they start to speak, that would be great. Lowell Rao, Reg Pollen, Pullen, and Joseph Jenowitz. And then we'll take three more from the Zoom system, Bruce Howell, Dwight Dottie, and Gary Katz. So Lowell Rao. Hello, my name is Lowell Rowe. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am from Brookings and I'm an um, avid fisherman. I've been that all my life. I'm an entomologist, marine biologist, and I'm, I'm uh, very interested in continuing to catch wild steelhead. Um, I think the monies collected um, for licensing will continue to help the program to study while still ahead, um, Jacques Cousteau said, what we learn about, we love, and what we love, we protect. Um, please support um, the expert opinion of the ODFW staff and their shark biologists and um, um, continue with allowing uh, catching and harvesting of the wild winter salmon. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Lowell. Um, Ridge Pullen. Go ahead. Okay. Ridge Pullen. Yes. Bandon. Mission members, uh, I thank you for allowing us to speak to this issue today. I'll be brief. I feel like this is a social issue, not a biological issue. People uh, that are, are for closing wild steelhead take believe that they're, they have a right to dictate their policies and their, their needs on the rest of us. And yet there's no biological reason for doing this. We have very healthy steelhead populations in Southwest Oregon. There are so many streams down here that are unfishable because they're in, pri in private ownership that are never fished, including streams on my property where there are healthy steelhead runs. So I don't understand this. The Rogue had almost a record steelhead run this last summer. There's plenty of opportunity to maintain the one in three here without any biological problems. As a biologist, will testify and have been telling you all along through this process. You're really impacting an area that's severely depressed economically. A lot of people depend upon fishing to at least supplement their diet. One in three doesn't, that won't go too far for that, but it's just one more nail in the coffin for all of the impoverished people that live here on the South Coast. Please don't do this. 
I sat down and looked at the southwest zone the other day. It's 150 miles of coastline. There are five hatchery steelhead rivers in southwest Oregon in 150 miles. On the north coast, there are a lot more hatcheries. So what's happened down here is that the rivers that have hatcheries are so crowded that it's unpleasant to go fishing. And that's, that's where we're at. And if you close all these streams to wild fish, everybody's gonna congregate on those five rivers and it's gonna be that much worse. You know, I would be in favor of spending more money on monitoring and I would be happy to contribute to that. We need to set up an, a way for anglers to pay more money to receive more monitoring so you can have accurate estimates of steelhead population. Please don't take away the one in three. Thank you. Thank you, Reg. We'll go to Joseph Janowitz. Good morning, I'm Joe Janowitz and I live on Hunter Creek here in Gold Beach. I'm a stakeholder in the process that produced the ODFW plan and I've been working with other stakeholders and ODFW representatives for over two years. I'm a salmon and trout enhancement program member and my friends and I love to fish for steelhead. We work on access issues and we often clean up trash in and around our waterways. We work closely with ODFW to rehabilitate and improve natural habitat, improve native fish stocks, educate the public, and ensure harvest does not exceed fish populations, reproductive capabilities. In short, we feel we are good stewards of the resource. We're the people that live and work on these streams year round and no one holds them in higher regard. ODFW staff has informed us as stakeholders that our winter steelhead populations here on the South Coast are not in jeopardy that the steelhead populations in our species management unit are quote, strongly guarded and robust and can withstand harvest. The research data indicates that the recommended one in three harvest rate of these fish will not adversely affect the population's viability. Don't be swayed by emotional outside groups espousing unproven theories. Follow the recommendations of your expert ODFW staff and the majority of the stakeholders and approve this compromise plan, comprehensive plan, excuse me, that provides some harvest and ensures monies will be available for future research and monitoring of the resource and continues to safeguard it for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, we'll do Bruce Howell, Dwight Dottie, and Gary Katz. Um, then the next three from the Curry Courthouse would be Earl Jenkins, Art Tidmarsh, and Charles Curry. So if we could go to Bruce Howell. Go ahead, Bruce. I think you're on mute. While we wait, maybe we could go to Dwight and we'll come right back to Bruce. Hello, uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, yes. Chairman and Director and Commissioners, uh, I'm one of your visiting uh, anglers that comes and spends several weeks in uh, Oregon injecting money into the uh, communities and enjoying steelhead fishing. Uh, I think I testified before that we've seen steelhead fishing decline in numbers significantly over the past 10 years from what it used to be, and especially in the last five. Um, I've exchanged a number of emails with, with the biologist, uh, Dr. Van Dyke, and uh, he's got some great answers, and, and you have a plan here to um, monitor fish, and there's an extensive amount of monitoring uh, identified in the plan one of the concerns I have is you don't identify funding for your plan. Um, maybe this is discussed elsewhere, but I don't think you have a plan if you don't have a way to pay for it. So I'm concerned about that, uh, which means that if you don't have a way for it to pay for it, a lot of this monitoring 
to ensure that steelhead are protected isn't going to happen. Um, the other thing is, is we rely a lot on projections from historical data, and that's not up to date. And I think everyone would agree that uh, the way things are going climate wise, uh, past history is not a very good indicator of what's happening now. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with most of the people that have spoken here. I think that you should exercise caution uh, in protecting wild fish because once they're gone, they're damn hard to get back. Um, so I'm worried that you won't have uh, adequate monitoring this year, even if you allow wild harvest to know just how good or bad the run is and be able to put the brakes on this. So I'm concerned about that. And uh, I, I thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I will be there to check on your progress this February. So uh, we'll see how things are going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dwight. Can we go back to Bruce Howell? Bruce? While we're waiting, we'll go to Gary Katz and then three from the courthouse. So go ahead, Gary. Thank you very much, commissioners, for allowing all of us to join you or at least hear our voices. And thank you for the technology that allows us to do this too. I live on the Applegate River and I know firsthand what the fisheries are like in Southern Oregon. I fish the Umpqua, I fish the Rogue, and it's no question that fish counts are down. And there's also no question that our data processing and collection is limited. I think this is not the time to depend on optimistic projections of what the fish counts might be over the next five years. Rather, I think this is the time to behave as conservative conservationists and protect the fisheries by establishing a five-year limit uh, and, and definitely not allow any harvesting of wild fish. And then after five years, let's see where we're at. That just seems like the sensible way to handle the situation that we're currently finding ourselves in with climate change, with warming waters, with all of the threats that we're seeing to our fishery. Thank you very much again for your time. Thank you, Gary. Um, let's go back one more time to see if Bruce Howell is available. Um, I see his name, and, but it looks like he's muted. Bruce? Then what we'll do is go to the, the courthouse for three more people and then take a 10 minute break and then start again. Um, when we come back after the break, we'll have Gino, Bernero, Charles Lilly, and Riyad Abul Nasser. So the three from the courthouse are Earl Jenkins, Art Tidmarsh, and Charles Curry. So Earl Jenkins. Earl? Yeah, my name's uh, Earl Jenkins. I'm an avid fisherman lived on the coast all my life and each year it seems like our river is declining in fish and uh, we do need more hatcheries no matter what people say and uh, I'd like to read you something the south coast anglers would like you to know that we are deeply concerned about the rogue coast conversation plan we favor following the traditional model of conservation and maintaining a choice when it comes to the harvest of our fish and we replace a tremendous value on retaining all our precious hatchery resources. Over 40 combined Oregon Fish and Wildlife staff and stakeholders worked for over two years to produce the most comprehensive plan we've ever written, an inclusive, unbiased group of stakeholders. And uh, we encourage the commission to trust the majority of stakeholders and ODF expert staff opinion and accept this plan with unanimous vote. And if the rivers, you know, are so bad that there's no fish, then the river should be closed, I think. But that's my own opinion. And thank you for being diligent with our efforts to maintain the future of our hatcheries. They're important to our community's environment and our culture and our economic well-being. All living creatures depend on salmonoids for their existence. The, if we didn't have the fishery, our towns would uh, probably dry up and go away because 
all these little towns live on on the tourism and fishing. So, tackle shops, restaurants, everything depend on our fishing. And I hope you guys accept this plan. Thank you, Earl. Art Tidmarsh. Yes. Uh, I don't need all these. I've got a loud voice. Uh, say my piece. Yeah. Go ahead. You're listening. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm here to protest against that because uh, I want to leave the way it is. Still that fishing. I don't see any need in taking it away from us. There's a lot of them out there. Um, I've been doing it for years. I understand why they're doing that. So I'm here to protest against it, and uh, I'm all for keeping the steelhead season the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then Charles Curry. Hi there, my name is Charles Curry. I'm a paraplegic, I'm in a wheelchair, and uh, I've been, I'm 55 years old. I've been fishing this river 53 years. And I am a sustenance fisherman and a hunter. And I, I value these fish and they keep me alive in the winter time. You can't go to the grocery store and buy fish that's like this. This is a, an amazing, um, it's an amazing fishery. And me and my family, we, re, we rely on this fish. So keep us, let us keep our fish, our, our native, thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for Gino Bernero, Charles Lilly, Riyad Abuul Nasser. So 10 minutes and be right back. Thank you, everyone. Here, Walt. Yes. Just to give you a heads up, those three individuals are not in the meeting room. Okay, then we would go right back to the courthouse instead. Um, did you hear anything from Bruce Howell? Because his name is listed. I have Bruce in here. I think that I may need to just talk to him about how to unmute his phone. Okay, then when we come back, let's start with Bruce and then go right back to the courthouse for the, the next three from there. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Who are they? Who are they? Ask your question. Who they are. Ask who they are. Who they are. Who they are. They are. James Antron, Rick Ellis, Patrick Hollinger. Thank you. Sure. Who is the last one? Rick Hollinger, okay. Um, Patrick Hollinger. Uh, James Ain't and Rick Ellis, Patrick Hollinger. You got the word, good. Patrick Hi, Bruce. I'm not sure if you're still on the line. Um, to unmute your, your computer, there should be on the lower left hand corner a little symbol that looks like a microphone. There you go. There we go. Okay. When we come back from break, Bruce, we're going to start with you. Okay, thank you. I'll just leave it like it is. Uh huh.
I've lost my spark. I will. Hello? Nikki? Oh, so hello. 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 Hi, Bruce. I'm still here. Yep. I just if, do. I do anything, Michelle, or just wait till you come on. You know what? You can actually, if you want to go ahead and put your your um, yourself back on mute during the break, then you can have conversations and have it not be broadcast. And okay. then um, when we return from break, um, I'll have you unmute and you'll give your testimony after the chair announces you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So then on break. So and you gotta move us up at the point that we're not happening. What did you do, Nikki? Oh. I, Nikki, mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to hang up. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't yeah. want to do this. I...
Welcome back, everyone. Michelle, are we back on? Yes, and um, we did have Bruce. Bruce Howell. Howell, we got his, his, um, his microphone going, but now I'm not seeing him. Okay, then um, I'll go ahead with the three people from the, the courthouse and we can try one more time to see if Bruce would be there when those three are finished. And just to let, welcome back everyone. And just to let everyone know, we'll, we'll go until um, probably about 1215 and see it, how many people we can get um, a chance to hear from in that time. And then we'll take a lunch break and then we'll come back for more people to testify. Um, and I would like to thank all of those people who have done a great job this time of staying within the time limits. It's very much appreciated. So Bruce is not available yet. So James Antron, Rick Ellis, Patrick Hollinger, and then we'll go to Brian Cowan, um, Tanner Banks, and Andrew Archer. So James, from the courthouse. Looks like the courthouse is still on mute. So if you could take it off mute and we could go ahead and hear from James. There we go. Okay, James. Oh, Ask them if they can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, James. We can hear okay, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is Jim Antrim. I live on the Winchuck River. I am the vice president of Oregon South Coast Fishermen. I would like to take this opportunity to address the on, commission on. on the Rogue South Coast you plan for native fish. I feel that the commission should vote to accept the plan presented by ODFW. Did you look studying to produce the plan? Also think about what you could do to the south coast of Oregon's economy if you were to shut down fishing entirely. One fish per day, three for the season is a very reasonable request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim. Rick Ellis. Yes, my name is Rick Ellis and I live in Brookings and uh, the experts in this situation would be the ODFW, if you ask me, and I've worked as a volunteer with them for the last six years, and they seem like pretty competent people. And what I don't understand is why our tax money goes to pay these guys to get these studies so we don't have to go through these type of things. And yet... I trust in them. I've worked with them. They're they're a knowledgeable group of people. And why is it that you don't agree with them? Do you feel they're not confident that you can't listen to what they have to say about this? Pretty much that's that's basically what I got to say. I mean, if they're not confident and you feel that, why are we paying taxes to pay their wages? Thank you, Rick. Shall we go to Patrick Hollinger? Good morning. My name is Patrick Hollinger. I'm from Gold Beach and own a, a lodging and fishing business here uh, locally. Um, in regards to our, our steelhead run, I've been to uh, several meetings uh, that ODFW has hosted and uh, you know, listening to them saying that our, our numbers here, especially, you know, on, on the Rogue River and, and Southern Oregon are strong and they do support the retention of wild fish. I don't see how it would be, you know, reasonable to, to take that away from our communities down here. Winter in general is a slower time for the Southern Oregon coast. Uh, the tourist season is, is done. Kids are back in school. Parents are back at work. And uh, a lot of the community uh, Gold Beach, Brookings, Port Orford rely heavily on uh, sport fishing and also, you know, uh, ocean commercial fishing. But, uh, you know, taking that uh, source of, of revenue and, you know, income away from, you know, our businesses um, in, a, in a time where, you know, trying to get business and get the draw for people to come and, and spend money in our communities, 
um, you know, it, is it's needed. It's, it's hard to get this time of year. So, you know, handcuffing us, especially in this region, uh, with again taking away another source of income, um, is is in my opinion not not fair, especially when um, the ODFW uh, employees and and biologists are are telling us that hey, it's okay. We think you you guys should keep um, your steelhead. Uh, so, anyways, that's that's my my stance on it. Um, I'm I'm pro keeping fish, and I'm also pro listening to our local ODFW uh, employees and spokespeople. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Patrick. Let's go to um, Brian Cowan, and then Tanner Banks, Andrew Archer, and then we'll go back to the courthouse again for three more people who would be Ken Thompson, James Aaron Duncan and Bill Divins. So Brian Cohen. Courthouse, or sorry, not courthouse, Brian Cohen. Then let's try Tanner Banks. Chair Wall, I don't have Tanner in the room. Andrew Archer. Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Andrew Archer, and I live in Ashland, Oregon. I'm a recreational steelhead fly fisherman who practices catch and release in the Rogue and South Coast watersheds. I frequent these rivers during the winter months, buying supplies in the local communities, eating at their restaurants, staying in their hotels. I make a point of picking up litter every time I am on one of these rivers to leave it a better place than the way I found it for the next angler to enjoy. I also work for a local company in Ashland, Oregon called Flywater Travel. It is a company that serves as a booking agency for fly fishing destinations around the globe, including the Rogue and South Coast watersheds. This portion of our business, my job, and the guides that we work with in this zone rely on returns of wild steelhead to stay in business and feed their families. I book dozens of clients to fly fish these rivers for wild steelhead every season. Each of these clients stay in local hotels, eat at local restaurants, and inject their money into the local economy in a variety of other ways. I can say with confidence that the thing that keeps these guests coming back year after year is the potential to catch and release a wild winter steelhead. I am concerned about winter steelhead in Southern Oregon because even in my short life experience, I have seen the decline unfolding before my eyes. Nowadays, whenever I'm on the river, I ask myself, will my future children know what a wild steelhead is? The October draft of the Rogue South Coast Conservation Management Plan proposes wild steelhead harvest without adequate population estimates, harvest rates, or overall population mortality. The current draft contains far too much uncertainty and implements excessive risk to wild steelhead in Southern Oregon. So my question is, why are we willing to risk something so fragile without the appropriate data available? Commissioners, please adopt alternative two, catch and release angling for wild winter steelhead on decision 3.1 of the alternatives. This necessary action will help ensure that we have abundant wild steelhead in Southern Oregon for years to come. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Let's go to Ken Thompson, James Duncan, and Bill Divin at the courthouse, and we will come back to Brian Cowan if he's here by then. So, Ken Thompson. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, a variety of groups, group of users spent many hours with ODF staff and, uh, and a plan to address many issues. The commission should <coughs> adopt a plan that follows our tradition, traditional models of conservation while allowing maximum choice for public utilization of the resource consistent with protecting natural productive salmon oils. Anglers should be provided a choice on harvest of wild winter steelhead. Science shows that a one-fifth or one-third harvest opportunity for wild winter steelhead would not damage the wild steelhead population on the southern coast. There certainly is no justification for a five-year moratorium on harvest of wild winter steelhead. 
because a significant amount of the watershed on the south coast are in federal ownership and receive a high degree of protection. The habitat in these watershed is the same of is the same of the highest quality habitat in Oregon and cannot support limited harvest of wild winter steelhead. Anglers who value catch and release are free to pursue that method, but they should not be allowed to limit other anglers who might value keeping a fish when the science shows the wild population can sustain a limited harvest. I also feel that hatchery production is extremely important on the south coast to maintain and enhance harvest opportunities for salmonoids. We all place a high value on wild salmonoid populations and want them to be protected, but science-based hatchery production is a valuable We lost the recording from the, the courthouse. Um, if you can still hear, thank you, Ken. And if we could go to James Aaron Duncan. Sure, Wall Aaron Duncan. I'm here. He's back. He had a little emergency he had to run to. Here's Aaron, thank you. Hi, my name is James Aaron Duncan. I am actually the president of Korea Dramas Fishman. Uh, the uh, hatchery here in town. So been here about 12 years now, been on the board for four years at the hatchery. And uh, you know, we love our fish. We like to protect them the best we can. We would also like to be able to keep and retain our fish. So the three and one that is proposed, I would like to say I'd like to support that and uh, keep it going as far as that goes on the statistics of our biologists. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go next to Bill Dibbins. And if you'll introduce yourself and go ahead. My name is Bill Dibbins. I'm enjoying my retirement job as a fishing guide living in Gold Beach. I'm also vice president of the board of directors of the Wild Rivers Land Trust. I believe that we need to safeguard our natural resources for future generations and sustainably use those resources today. Before retiring, I spent 25 years managing Silicon Valley companies after earning a PhD in chemistry. This unique viewpoint, I offer the following input. I attended the ODFW in July meeting in Gold Beach where biologists presented winter steelhead harvest recommendations of one per day and five per year. The commission needs to go with their own scientist recommendations. At that meeting, I was shocked to learn that what a vocal group of environmental radicals feel should even be taken into consideration when setting harvest limits. When do social considerations come into play when making science-based decisions that impact not only steelhead populations, but also anglers' ability to enjoy the resource in our local economies. Radical environmentalists will say we don't know enough to harvest wild steelhead. Think about the we don't know enough to harvest wild steelhead argument, and you'll see how silly it is. Almost all the ocean fish that we eat are wild fish. Can you really say the methodology used to manage to harvest the wild ocean fish is any better than the method used to manage wild steelhead harvest? Of course not. To the contrary, with the various inverted monitoring techniques, we have much better data for steelhead than we have for setting wild ocean fish harvest. And even the most radical environmentalists don't even question that ocean harvest methodology when they eat wild ocean fish at their local sushi bar. To say that only one species, specifically wild steelhead, cannot sustain a scientifically determined harvest is absolutely ludicrous. However, if you're a true believer in the no wild steelhead harvest cult, then you will try to sow fear, uncertainty, and doubt as we've heard today. I ask the commissioners to stand up against the anti-science snow harvest cult and follow their own biologist recommendations of one per day and five per year. If you reject your biologist, biologist recommendations and keep them on staff, you're not doing your job. Since in rejecting their harvest recommendations, you are saying that they are not competent enough to do their jobs. In that case, why do you keep paying? Thank you. Let's go to Stephen Godin. Brandon Worthington and Rory McCabe um, from so forth. Those are Zoom. And then we'll go back to the courthouse for three more people. Anna Krug, Bruce Blanthor, uh, Blanthorn, and Cliff Lance. So Stephen Godin, Brandon Worthington, Rory McCabe. Stephen, are you there? 
If not, I see that Brandon Worthington is, so let's go to Brandon. Hey, commissioners. Thanks so much for taking the time to have us give you guys a couple of comments. Uh, my name is Brandon Worthington. I'm a fishing guide who's had the privilege to fish and guide across the rivers that are up for debate in the RSP, and I have been doing that for over a decade. I want to voice my support for catch and release of wild winter steelhead until we have hard, adequate population data to inform appropriate take levels. We currently just don't have that data. Last year, a few seasonal aid positions were introduced to gather spawning data to inform managers. However, year does not provide enough data to inform a management decision of a species with a three to five year anadromous life cycle. If you add in the vastness and the ruggedness of all the watersheds that are up for debate right now, it's exceptionally unreasonable to expect a few seasonal positions can provide expedient information to support take at this time. So I recommend we take a pause, we can keep fishing and uh, see what the data shows here in a few years. Um, these rivers are also kind of the other point is that these rivers are one of the only places left on the West Coast where you can still harvest wild fish. And so because of that, my experience on the water is showing that we're getting a magnified effect of people coming to these areas to harvest specifically because they can't other places. So um, I'm seeing that as a negative. There's a lot of pressure for a lot fewer fish. And as someone who's out there making a living on catching and releasing these fish and telling my clients that there are fish there to fish for, um, that's getting, that's becoming a harder and harder sell. Um, it doesn't seem like there's really any downside to pausing harvest at this time as someone who's on the water over 200 days a year. Um, so please be precautionary until you have the data in hand. And then if you're looking for an example of what catch and release might mean for this region, even if the data doesn't support it and says we can harvest in a few years, look at the North Umpqua. Everybody bemoaned the fact that perhaps angling is gonna decline, opportunities to decline if it goes to catch and release. Well, if we look at it, it hasn't. People are still angling um, with as much intensity as ever and everybody's still fishing. When presented with the choice of fishing, catching fish and letting them go or not fishing at all because there are no fish, I think people are gonna choose option one. So please consider that, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Steve Godin, Stephen Godin. Chair Wall, I have Stephen um, in the room. We're having troubles getting him unmuted. And I and Mary McCabe is not in the room. And what about the person that we missed before? Um, never mind. I think we went back to them. So let's go on then to um, Anna Krug, Bruce Blanthorne, and Cliff Lance at the courthouse. Hello. My name is Anna Krug. You know, it's no secret that when it comes to our South Coast community, our voice has been underrepresented. While we are engaged in our step groups and community activities like river cleanups, riparian enhancements, educational outreach, and hatchery propagation, many of us are not interested in and oftentimes don't have access to electronic media and outlets. It's common for people here not to have the internet service. Some people here don't even feel the need for a computer. We don't have any point and click the button websites to submit an auto reply testimony for people from other states to help save the planet. And yet we've shown up time after time to give repeat testimony about what is important to us. You should see the crowd here today with just one business day's notice. Those of us that can are here again to reiterate our support for harvest of wild winter stillhead and are in favor of adopting this plan as is. If the commission meetings were in person on the South Coast, the, the number of attendees in favor of harvest and the plan would be huge. The process almost feels like it is being unnecessarily brought forward for public content comment over and over until your desired result is achieved. We live here, we care about our fish, our rivers and our communities. We give directly of our time and money. We are not paid representatives of profit-driven Save the Planet entities, and we're not push the button voices from New York, Australia, Canada, or Colorado. In closing, I'd just like to add that we have ODFW staff that are highly educated and qualified, and that we pay to help guide you through these processes. To disregard their opinion on the matter and rewrite any of this plan by anyone other than the staff and the stakeholders who are supposed to be the public representatives would only reinforce the growing level of concern from your public, the people you are supposed to represent, that the science and education take a back seat to emotional ideals. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Anna. Let's go to Bruce Blanthorne. My name is Bruce Blanthorne. Uh, good morning. Uh, 
I moved to Oregon about four years ago uh, in order to fish. I like to fish. Uh, I've done a lot of lake fishing and the catch and release thing on lakes and slot limits. You see a lot of dead fish floating. I don't agree with catch and release. Uh, same with fly fishing, even using barbless hooks. Uh, you still have a lot of fish die. Uh, and I kind of think it's the same with the hatchery and wild steelhead. Uh, I, I support the one, I'd like to see the one in five, I think is a good way to go. But if we can only get one and three, I would support that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, the next person is Cliff Lance, um, and then we'll go to Roger Lindquist, George Ravel, and Scott Howell. So go ahead, Cliff. I'm unmuted. This is Steve. Which Steve, Steve Godin? Yes, this is Steve Godin. Godin, go ahead, Steve. And okay, then, thank uh, you. Sorry for the, the confusion here. I somehow having trouble getting unmuted. <clears throat> Chair Wall, ODFW Commissioners, and Director Melcher. I'm Steve Godin, residing in Scottsburg, Oregon, President of the Oregon Coast Anglers. I represent Oregon Sport Anglers to the PFMC Groundfish Advisory Panel. I'm a member of the ODFW Sports Fishers Advisory Council and a local step volunteer. I'm speaking for myself and on behalf of the 200 Ang Oregon Coast Angler members who support ODFW's recommendation regarding the Rogue South Coast Multi-Species Conservation and Management Plan. We support ODFW's recommendation for interim angling regulations harvest of winter wild steelhead, one and three, and upgrades to the Rogue Mitigation Hatchery infrastructure, <clears throat> the new authorizations, Rogue South Coast Steelhead Validation and Rogue South Coast Steelhead Harvest Tag, recommended in the RSP, will fund the additional monitoring to provide needed data to manage the southern zone salmonids. <clears throat> the proposed five-year review would be based on well-founded so science resulting in justified management of the resources. And in the interim, ODFW has all of the resources necessary to manage the fishery on an annual basis. Most anglers, including myself, fish to harvest. The public survey taken in, in 2019 by ODFW supports that belief. 80% of those surveyed responded moderately important to extremely important for the opportunity to harvest fish. Catch and re release regulations are contrary to public interest and most of us that purchase Oregon fishing licenses. I urge the commissioners to accept ODFW Southern Zone RSP recommendation and limited harvest of wild steelhead. Thank you for your opportunity to speak and for your consideration. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Cliff Lance. Commissioner Wall, Commissioners, uh, Director Melcher, thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony on this important issue. My name is Cliff Lance from North Bend, Oregon. I have lived on the Southern Oregon coast for almost 50 years. I've owned an annual fishing and hunting license uh, all these years. Uh, since I got here, I have been a volunteer for ODFW on many, many habitat and fishery projects uh, since 1973. Today, I am here representing the Oregon Anglers Alliance as a director, Coos County Step Commission as a director, and a board member of South Coast Anglers and Step Association. I'm also an owner of the Lucky Lodge RV Park lo located here on the Rogue River which caters to our fishing community. Needless to say, my middle name is Fish, and I am vested in these decisions. Over the last two years, over, over the last two years, over 40 biologists and stakeholders have worked together to produce the most comprehensive plan ever written by an inclusive, unbiased, and balanced group of vested individuals. I encourage the body of commissioners 
to vote for full endorsement of these conclusions supporting this plan unanimously. unanimously. Please support continued harvest while winter steelhead. Please follow our proven successful traditional model of conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Roger Lindquist. Good morning, Chairman Wall and commissioners. My name is Roger Lindquist. I am the vice president for Curry and Adamus Fishermen. Uh, we manage and run the local hatchery here at the mouth of the road. I'm also the local uh, South Coast Stack member. So my bluff or my bottom line up front is please follow the science. It's been two years of stakeholder and staff efforts to look at this, this uh, data. The original data was uh, proposed was one in five. There was compromise. Uh, they looked for consensus and they compromised to one in three. This was good. This is good uh, to get the compromise. Um, but now it appears that some people believe that this is not good enough. So we should not listen to social pressure. We should listen to science. So let's not, you know, Listen to your staff. I, I've heard it said before, and I won't. I won't uh, labor the point with uh, uh, with you folks here. But listen to your staff. They're a good staff. They 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 have looked at the data. Um, the one in three is the compromise. I believe we need to. It's a conservative compromise, and it's a comprehensive conservative compromise. I believe we need to stay with one in three and not go to the Dacronian uh, option of catch and release. So please stay with one and three. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, Scott Howell. Hello, you got me? Yes. Yeah, hi, I was born and raised here in Southern Oregon and I've made a living solely as a fishing guide for 30 years now. During this time, I've seen the steelhead runs on many rivers brought to the brink of extinction and a multitude of regulations being instated to try and deal with the reality of just how fragile these populations are. Here in Southern Oregon, we are basically the last place on earth where its fisheries managers can rationalize putting our runs at risk by allowing the harvest of native steelhead. This bring me, brings me to the point where as a proponent of catch and release, the elephant in the room is the state's recommendation to continue the killing of wild steelhead. As an ODFNW volunteer, I've gotten to know many of the regional staff. They are people that truly care about our wild steelhead populations and have come to their conclusions in good faith. However, I strongly disagree. I understand the state has their models to help project run size and formulate management plans, but as with any scientific model, there are variables that impact its results. And while we are now faced with the variable of climate change in this equation that is less predictable and having a bigger impact on the resource than originally predicted, even the state acknowledges the effects of climate change have come upon us faster than expected. I strongly feel we need a better grasp of what's coming down the pipe with this factor, as well as get a more definitive idea of actual run size before we do anything but manage this resource in a precautionary way. It was not that long ago I testified in front of the commission about this very same catch and release issue regarding the MQA system. At that time, I only predicted that the catch and release regulations would not lead to a decrease in angler pressure. But now, years later, I can tell you with certainty that such regulations will not limit the number of anglers out targeting steel at our rivers. Since the time the catch and release regulations were instated on the Umqua, everyone would agree fishing pressure has only increased exponentially. I put my boat in every day with lifelong rogue river guides that are now opting to fish the Umqua fully understanding they will release any wild steelhead they catch. I would like to end by asking the same question that has already been asked here today. Why not put the brakes on here and put into place precautionary catch and release policy until we get a better grasp of all the factors at hand? And we do still have hatchery fish to harvest. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, I don't see um, George Rebell uh, here. So we'll go on to three people from the Courthouse, Kathy Eisenhart, Peter Eisenhart, and Michael Becker. So if we could start with Kathy Eisenhart. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're out in the hall. 
Who was the last one called out? Michael Becker. Thank you. Here you are. Yep. So, Kathy Eisenhart. Good morning. My name is Kathy Eisenhart. I live here in Gold Beach, a few miles up the north bank of the Rogue River. I'm a fisherman's wife, and I urge you to wholly accept this plan with a unanimous vote. <clears throat> over 40 combined ODFW staff and stakeholders worked for over two years to produce the most comprehensive plan ever written by an inclusive, unbiased, and balanced group of stakeholders. ODF ODFW expert opinion and data illustrate that sport fishing has no effect on the viability of these fish. Have you ever had a fresh, wild winter steelhead cooked on a grill on a cool morning on the bank of the Rogue River? Not only is it delicious, it's also gratifying on a very deep level to be so connected to nature, the river, and the past in an area where the Tatutani Indian villagers fished for hundreds of years before us. This personal connection is one of the major reasons my husband and I make our home here. So I ask you to please unanimously approve this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And just before we go to Peter, the, I'm going to name the, the six that will follow the three of you at the courthouse. So after Peter Eisenhart and Michael Becker, Emily Bowes, Ty Wyatt, and Matthew Lund, then back to the courthouse for Dave Keen, Mark Stevens, Mary Duncan. So if we could go to Peter Eisenhart, please. Good morning. My name is Peter Eisenhart. I live in Gold Beach along the southern coast of Oregon. I am the president of Lucky Lodge RV Park, located on the north bank of the Rogue River, eight miles north of Gold Beach. The original Lucky Lodge was washed away in the floods in 1964. It was then incorporated in 1971 reopened as an RV park, an RV park that favored, that was favored by fishermen for over 50 years. Any further reduction in harvest opportunity for winter steelhead will have devastating and unrecoverable consequences on the South Coast winter economy. We are all impacted. Hotels, RV parks, gas stations, tackle shops, restaurants, grocery stores, everyone. We are the people that work and live on these streams year round. ODFW expert opinion and data illustrate that sport fishing has no effect on the viability of these fish. It is habitat and ocean conditions that dictate this. Please don't use climate change as an excuse to further personal agendas. No one holds these fish at a higher value than we do. We have and will continue to safeguard them for all future generations. I strongly encourage the commission to trust the over 40 combined ODFW staff and stakeholders who have worked for over two years to produce the most comprehensive plan ever written by an inclusive, unbiased, and balanced group of stakeholders. For the commission to do anything else but to wholly accept this plan with the unanimous vote will undoubtedly further erode the public's trust in the ODFW and the process. I urge you to please follow our proven, successful, traditional model of conservation and please accept this plan with a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Michael. Yes, Chair. Well, Michael Becker had an emergency and had to go back to work. However, he did have a testimony asking to please support the plan and support Harvest of Wild Winter Steelhead. Thank you, sir. And we'll go to Emily Bowles. Bowes. Emily? Mary, Emily is not in the room and neither is Matthew Lund. Then Ty Wyatt, and then we'll go back to the courthouse for the three I named a minute ago. So go ahead, Matthew. I'm sorry, did I miss the, which one is in the, which of those? Ty Wyatt. Go ahead, Ty. Chair Wall, Commissioners, ODF and W staff, thank you for giving the opportunity for all the voices to be heard on this issue. Um, after listening to two hours of this testimony, it's become very well that this is even more an emotional issue than I may have thought. Um, I was born and raised in Oregon. I have a lifelong passion for steelhead. I caught my first steelhead over 30 years ago. 
and it's changed my life. I've split my time conducting fisheries research and being a fishing guide in Alaska. I, I reside in Washington and I fish Oregon more than I fish Washington. I'm here to support this plan for wild harvest, not because I like to go out and kill wild ste steelhead, because that's what ODF and W staff clearly illustrates that angler threats are not an issue here. The biggest threat to future, future opportunities for anglers is angler apathy. The idea that if we give up this right to catch and retain steelhead, we'll have more in the future is not true. And this can't be more better illustrated than on the Washington coast right now. It wasn't enough that anglers are not allowed to harvest wild steelhead, but this year they're not only allowed, they're not allowed to fish half the rivers on the Washington coast, uh, the rivers that have remained open, there's no fishing from a boat, no fishing with bait and barbless hooks. Furthermore, the same people that push to have this wild retition taken away have asked anglers not to even fish for steelhead. So I want you guys to take long, hard thought about if we went to catch and release, it's not about catch and release steelhead. It's about going down the road of less future angling opportunities, period. Thank you guys for your time. Thank everyone for their testimony and their input. Thank you, Ty. Dave Keen. Dave. Good morning, commissioners. I'm here. My name is Dave Keen. I'm the president of the Oregon South Coast Fishermen based in Brookings. I'm a board member of the Oregon Coast Anglers. I also serve on the ODFW Sport Fishing Advisory Council. Uh, today, you've already heard some testimony from some of our Oregon South Coast Fishermen Club members, but I'm here speaking on another 180 club members that could not be here to give testimony. Once again, the commission finds itself confronted with considerable public comment on an impending action. One option is to count noses and go with a majority. The other and most sensible is to follow your ODFW staff recommendations regarding the RSP. We encourage the commission to trust the plan. Trust your ODFW staff and the stakeholders that spent over two years producing this proposal. Throughout the process, there's been considerable discussion with the stakeholder groups and many modifications have been then made based on the input. Wildlife management decisions should be based on the best available science, not on the sheer numbers of responses from people who write in, call in and message you from other states or even from other countries. Assessing current populations with a standard harvest program is key in procuring scientific data. Eliminating harvest with catch and release only will likely lead to false positive conclusions. The success of this plan is contingent on maintaining the harvest of wild winter steelhead. In conclusion, we recommend that the commission rule in favor of the RSP and the ODFW staff recommendation of a limited harvest of wild winter steelhead. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dave. Mark Stevens. Chair Wall, Mark Stevens wanted to be here today to testify to uh, please accept the plan and, and allow continued harvest of wild winter steelhead. But when he saw the time frame extended, he didn't think he'd be able to make it. So he's a no-show. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Duncan. We'll go to you. And Mary, just uh, before you start speaking, let me tell you the other, the next group, Elaine Sherrar, Rich Nawa, Alex Ng, and then back to the courthouse for David Sofasom, Jay Lander, Mark Coates. So Mary Duncan. Hello, my name is Mary Duncan and I've been living in Bend for, Bend, in Gold Beach for almost 11 years now. I, I came here to fish. We moved here because we fish and hunt, and this is the most beautiful place in the world, and we'd like it to stay that way. Uh, I am a member of a group, but I'm also, as an individual, uh, asking you to accept the ODFW and uh, go forward with the three-in-one plan. Um, what you may not realize, because you can't see them out in the hall, are all the people that have come. They don't, they don't come to these kind of meetings, but there's tons of people 
that want something to be done. They, they want us to be saved. They don't want to lose their ability to keep fish. And we'd like to have more. We'd like to have more fish to harvest, more hatcheries, more abundance. ODFW wants us to have abundance. We'd love to have abundance in the, our fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Let's go to Elaine and then Rich Nawa, Elaine Sherrar, Rich Nawa, Alex Ng. Michelle, are they in the room? Here, Wall, I don't have Elaine, Rich, or Alex in the room at this time. Then let's go um, continue at the courthouse with David Sofasom, Jay Lander, Mark Coates, and then we'll check back to see if, if Elaine, Rich, and Alex are available. So go ahead, David. David Sofasom. Hey, they're getting him. He's out in the hall. The three, the three from the courthouse that would be next after those, just to give a little forewarning, Stephen Hathaway, Brian Pomfori, and Justin Taylor. So let's go back to David Sofasom, Jay Lander, Mark Coates. David and We're looking for uh, Dave right now, and uh, if we have to chase down Jay Lander, can we see Oh, Jay, you're up. Awesome. Here's Jay. Thank you. Okay, my name's Jay Lander. I'm 58 years old and I have fished the Rogue River for 50 plus years, the last 12 as a guide. While guiding my ratio of non-clipped or native to clipped steelhead is approximately three to one native over clip. I believe the health of the winter steelhead run here has only gotten stronger. When I was in my 20s and 30s, mid-February usually marked the end of the run. In the last 10 years, I've had good numbers into mid-March. We are a small community without a large metropolitan area near us. The fishery does not get the pressure as other streams near densely populated areas. It is my belief that the retention of a small number of native fish would not have an adverse effect on the fishery. It would, however, have an advent effect on our economy I'm not a fisheries biologist. That is why I trust our local ODF and W biologists. Steve and John live here, raised their families here, and they fish here. This is their job to protect and make educated decisions on how to best manage our fisheries for our community. And our job as sports people, professional and non-professional, is to support, support and assist them, not for special interest groups who do not live here, are not involved in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Let's go to Mark Coates. Yeah, Mark couldn't be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. We'll go to Clark Rector, Jim Andrus, and Mark or Rich Sims. And then three more from the courthouse that I read out earlier, Stephen Hathaway, Brian Pomfori, and Justin Taylor. So Clark Rector, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Clark Rector, psychologist and lifelong angler. I appreciate the work that has gone into the RSP, and I think it's a great start. Wild steelhead are a favorite among recreational anglers today, and the thrill and joy of landing one is perhaps the finest experience a freshwater angler can have in the Pacific Northwest. Steelhead have been around for millennia, long before the arrival of any humans, and modern angling techniques. When considering the vast evolutionary timescale, it's not hard to see that they now face unprecedented challenges, including highly complex ones like climate and ocean change and many others. Scientific and anecdotal accounts of steelhead decline on the West Coast are easy to come by. So I'll be brief here and simply state that it's very unlikely any river in Oregon is immune to the general decline of anadromous salmonids on the West Coast. So what can we do? While climate and ocean change is not feasible to eliminate, other variables are relatively far easier to adjust and implement in the near future, like harvest. Harvest is a key variable we can change for the benefit of wild steelhead. The benefits of wild catch and release are many. Wild release increases angling opportunity, a long time ODF and W goal. The best way to increase opportunity is not by maintaining wild harvest, it's by having enough wild catchable fish to catch in the first place. How could a new angler 
get hooked on steelheading and buy licenses and hire guides if they don't hook one at all. Next, wild release helps safeguard genetic diversity, uh, which helps safeguard a species success. Also, my reasoning is that we, we do know the mortality rate of wild retention is 100%. That means zero further spawning opportunities this year or the next or ever. For steelhead are unique in that they are capable of multiple spawning runs. Most of all, wild release helps to balance the unprecedented challenges steelhead face today and helps nature's fish hatchery work at its best as it's been doing successfully for a very long time. I also raise this point. The fact that many ask to continue wild retention suggests that mother nature herself is better able to provide catchable fish than human run hatcheries. So let's protect nature's fish hatchery and let the broodstock do their thing. To conclude, I sincerely request that actions are taken to enact catch and release for all wild steelhead in Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. We'll go to um, Jamandris. Go ahead, Jim, and then Rick Sims, or Rich Sims. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Chair Wall, commissioners, and Director Melcher, thank you for your time and attention to the future management of wild winter steelhead in Southwest Oregon. My name is Jim Andrus, and I support adopting catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead throughout the region. I have guided the Upper Rogue River for 15 years, and without fail, August through December account for more days on the water than the rest of the year combined. Worth noting here is that ODFW manages wild summer steelhead under catch and release regulations. And still, my guests return year after year, keeping me in this crazy business of chasing fish, supporting my family, and contributing to our local economy. Today, Wild anadromous fish face a growing list of factors, including climate and ocean change, that contribute to troubling population trends throughout their native range and in our region. ODFW acknowledges a change in climate and bluntly states on their website that current conditions, and I quote, are undermining the ability of lands and waters to support Oregon's native fish and wildlife and the cultural and economic benefits they provide. If this represents a serious and immediate threat to the department's ability to achieve its mission and meet its statutory mandates to manage the public trust resources in its care, end quote. Given this reality and uncertainty, please stand with Oregon's wild winter steelhead today and for the future. Adopt catch and release regulations throughout the Southwest zone. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, or sorry, thank you, Jim. And we will come back to Rich if, he, if we can <clears throat> get there soon. In the meantime, back to the courthouse for Stephen yeah, Hathaway. Well. Yes. Well, um, Rich Sims is in the room. Oh, then go ahead, Rich. And then we'll go to the courthouse for the three I named earlier. And then Shaw Orton, Brian Mullaney, and Curtis White. So go ahead, Rich. Hello, Chair Wall. Commissioners, Director Milcher, thank you for the opportunity to comment, provide comment today. My name is Rich Thames. I'm a conservationist, steelhead conservationist, and I have enjoyed fishing the rivers of Southern Oregon for wild steelhead in a special place. I believe also that wild steelhead conservation knows no boundaries. Uh, all along the West Coast and British Columbia have seen devastating wild steelhead returns with many closures this year. All is not well in steel, wild steelhead country. A couple of months ago, I sent the commission a document titled The Biological and Economic Benefits of Wild Steelhead Release. I hope you had a chance to review and read it as it provides scientific info as well as social economic benefits of wild steelhead release. In Washington, wild steelhead release regulation was adopted statewide through the and through the process, we heard many of the same arguments against adopting such a regulation. People will stop fishing, communities will suffer economically, et cetera. These arguments are often a red herring. Since adopting such a regulation, cities such as the city of Forks and other coastal communities have all overflowed with anglers. Hotels are full, guides are booked, and more anglers care about the future of wild steelhead. Again, we've built more advocates that really care about the resource. 
there are hatchery fish available for harvest. So why is there really a need to continue to harvest a wild steelhead when scant or no data is really available? And we may be in doubt. The Oregon coast and Klamath Mountain DPS is two of the few DPS that's not yet listed. We have a habit of not managing proactively when it comes to wild steelhead. We usually manage by reaction through closure and, and when bruns crash. There's no opportunity when rivers are closed due to depressed runs or collapsed runs in wild steelhead. Please adopt alternative number two. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rich. Stephen Hathaway. Hathaway. My name is Steve Hathaway. Thank you for letting me talk. Uh, we moved here about 11, 12 years ago for the fishing. <laughs> Uh, we need the fish in for healthy eats, and we bring 20 to 25 people here from Idaho every year. They buy their out-of-state licenses, they rent motels, everything. I mean, we need to keep it uh, the one in three and, and let our professionals do theirs. Uh, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Steve, and for your brevity as well. Brian Pomfori. Chair Wall, Brian and Justin are both MIAs. Uh, if we may, we've got a couple of alternatives ready to go here, if you're good with that, just to keep things moving. Are they people that were already signed up or not yes. signed up? They're signed up to testify out of the Curry County Commission here. Okay, go ahead. We have Bruce Bertrand. And John Ward. Bruce will be up first. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Melcher, uh, and the commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Bruce Bertrand, Coos Bay, Oregon. I'm a member of Oregon Anglers Alliance. South Coast Anglers Association and on the board of Coos County Step Commission. I've been active uh, with multi-species plans for a long time, like this um, mid-coast or central coast plan, which is adopted in 2014. I would uh, advocate for you to accept this plan that we're discussing today uh, for the southwestern coast. Personally, I'd rather have a one in five limit as we've had uh, Fish biologists from the Rogue River testify at our meetings that that would not hurt the wild population. So one in three or one or five, you know, I could accept. Uh, one thing, you will be challenged by people who do not want any retention of a wild fish and don't be fooled by their slippery slope argument. It's really not an argument at all. Uh, it doesn't hold any water. Um, the reason for that is ODFW has the authority to intervene at any time in any kind of emergency situation. On the 2014 multi-species plan, it's in a footnote. Uh, and if you've read that plan, that they have that authority. They've done that on the Coos River, the Umpqua River, and the Coquil River since 2014. So they've done things that supersede the regulations of the 2014 document. And they can do the same here. If this is accepted tomorrow when you vote on it, uh, and the winter steelhead is an emergency situation, they monitor it, they think there needs to be an intervention, they can do that. But there is no slip and slope. They have the authority to intervene at a given moment. Uh, and it's the same with any kind of conservation plan of uh, this not retain any for five years. Well, ODFW constantly monitors them. They constantly are on top of the things. They're constantly investigating. They're constantly meeting. And they have the authority to intervene. intervene. And so that's always a built-in safeguard, which shouldn't be scared about some slippery slope type of thing. And also the people involved in this uh, document, from what I've been told by uh, people who know, like Reese Bender, you are all familiar, familiar with Reese Bender. Uh, Bruce, retired. If, if you could kind of wrap up that your time is up. Okay, a retired fish biologist. He said it's the most thorough stakeholder document ever produced. And if it's not accepted, it's like, well, what's the use of ever being on a stakeholder meeting in the future? A very diverse group of people made a great effort, spent much time producing this, and it needs to be accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. 
Um, did you at the courthouse say that the people you were substituting in had already <laughs> signed up to testify and you were substituting them in earlier or did I get that right? Because I didn't find- They are already, they're already signed up to testify, Bruce Bertrand and John Ward both. Okay, go ahead, John list. Ward, and I'll take you off later. Yes, go ahead. Very good. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for having all of us. Um, at this point, you've pretty much heard it all. Uh, I don't know what any of us could say in terms of information that you haven't heard. And that goes also, of course, for the uh, stakeholders document. Uh, I think the simplest thing to say is since you've heard it all, it, I really think it is upon you to do the right thing. And the right thing here is to pay attention to the hard work and the long time devoted by the, all the state workers. We've already made compromises. They've, whichever side of this issue you're on, we've made important compromises that most people can live with. And uh, it shouldn't have to go any further at this point. Uh, we have a, why have a, as Bruce said before me, why have a stakeholders process? It's been a workable process for a number of years. And uh, if you have the result of that and they make any sense to you, I think it's imperative that you go with that because if you don't, uh, you're really, uh, insulting the process itself and the hard work of your own agency's uh, scientists and biologists. So thank you. Thank you, John. Shaw Orton and then Brian Mullaney and then Chris Curtis White. Is Shaw here? Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much. Hi, I am Shay Orton. I live here in Southern Oregon and I, these are my home waters, right? So we're talking about um, issues that are really close to home to me. Um, I have a bachelor's in outdoor adventure leadership as well as psychology. And I did research on just a lot of things. So I know biases, things are heated. I see that um, a lot of people have their hearts on this matter, but I wanna talk about the youth. So when we're talking about wild steelhead and conservation, I teach at a local high school here in Medford and I teach at Southern Oregon University and I work as a photographer and I teach my students on a very just standard basis conservation and what that means. That means debarbing your hooks. That means you know, keeping the fish wet when you pull that fish up, like what it, do you see the fin or is the fin missing the adipose fin? And so it seems to me like it would be easy to, to focus on the education piece of why it would be important for us to make sure that, to make this change. Um, I don't believe we have brought science to the picture in our decision altogether. I think we have statistics on juvenile fish, but we don't on what like adult fish um, as well as making sure we're taking data from rivers across all of Oregon, not just from lim limited areas um, that are not seeing our exact wild fish count. Um, if you've talked to anybody and said, hey, like, do you remember fishing when you were a kid? Um, almost everybody will remember the exact moments they spent out fishing. And so I want my daughter and I want our youth to be able to get on the waters um, readily. I also, I'm concerned because as we saw rivers be closed down all across Oregon, there was a, so much pressure that was brought to our area. I've seen firsthand so many um, people that have traveled and I'm friends with them and I'll have conversation. Um, and fortunately, they, for the most part, are all catch and release and they agree with that. But gosh, when you don't regulate and you don't change that, um, catch and release standard and you have a lot of pressure, I think that creates a problem for our areas if you don't across the board take that into consideration. So I am all for catch and release. 
Thank you, Shay. And so sure. hope- thank you so much. I love it here. And uh, I hope our kids can 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 see our wild steelhead. I don't think we should underestimate the power of the pressure. Thank you, Shay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Brian Mullaney. Good morning, commissioners, Chair Wall. My name is Brian Mullaney. I am speaking with you today to show my support for imposing catch and release regulations for wild fish, including salmon and steelhead on all Southern Oregon waterways. As a property owner on the banks of the mighty Rogue River just below Dodge Bridge, I hope to be able to continue to fish for wild steelhead for decades to come. My family has retreated to our tiny cabin on the Rogue for over 40 years and have watched with disappointment as the fish returns have dwindled. Science has proven that wild fish are more adept at surviving during climate change and therefore require additional protections to ensure long-term growth of these fish populations. The time will soon come for my two-year-old daughter to don her own waders and step into the cool waters of the Rogue River to pursue her own fish of a thousand casts. I just pray that there will be enough wild fish left for her to see one with her own eyes and feel the joy of letting that chrome bullet slip back into its native waters unscathed. As commissioners at ODFNW, it is your job to secure the long-term viability of recreational angling for all Oregonians. Protecting wild fish now will ensure that you will be selling more fishing license in the future. Ignore the short-term windfalls and prioritize sustainable long-term economic growth by protecting wild fish. My daughter and my family are depending upon you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And before we go to Curtis White, the three next people from the courthouse are Tim Bueller, Andy Martin, and Janet Jeffrey. And then we'll go to Harvey Young, Harry Piper, and Francis Oyoung um, f- from the Zoom system. So Curtis White, and then we'll go to the courthouse. Chair Wall, Curtis White is not in the room at the moment. Then. Tim Bueller from the courthouse, Andy Martin, Janet Jeffrey. And just for to be um, ready, the next three from the courthouse after that would be Lucy Labonte, Sam Waller, and Neil Rogers. So Tim Bueller. I'm just about that. Okay. What? I was gonna say, are you able to call my phone? But... Tim Bueller no. from the courthouse? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Are we ready at the courthouse then? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Hi, my name is Tim Bueller. Um, I'm a uh, just recently retired biology teacher at Brookings Harbor High School. I have a degree in fishery science and a degree in wildlife science. And <coughs> with my degrees, and my expertise of being a teacher. I've read the um, management plan proposed by, um, for our South Coast Rivers here. And I believe that it is well-written and um, will will be something that will be able to be uh, useful for uh, the upcoming future. Um, As a, stakeholder, I believe that we should make use of the proposed plan because we've used a lot of time and resources. We've had biologists, we have, we have community members, two years of time have been used to develop a plan to manage and use our fish. And I think that this is a a good plan to adopt. I believe that we should follow the recommendations by the biologists. As a science teacher, um, trying to teach kids about conservation, conservation is the wise use of resources. And I can teach them catch and release. I can teach a lot of things. But when I take my uh, scouts and my scout troop and I take students fishing and we Badly hook a wild fish and it's bleeding and it's going to die. It's hard to teach the wise use of a resource when we're going to put something back that isn't going to make it. So the current plan's recommendation of a very small amount of fish that can be retained 
wild fish can be entertained, I think is a useful thing. It's a useful tool. Um, I've listened to a lot of the testimony this morning and a lot of the uh, people who have, have presented have been from out of this region. And I understand that their rivers are what their rivers are, but the biologists studied our rivers and they found that our rivers, winter steelhead, can have a small limited harvest. And I believe that we should listen to their recommendation. So uh, thank you for listening to me. And by the way, thank you for all that you folks do to help manage our fish and wildlife resources. I appreciate your effort. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, let's go to Andy Martin and then Janet Jeffrey. Chair Wall, Director Melcher, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Andy Martin. I'm a full-time fishing guide and charter boat operator in Brookings, Oregon. I'm one. Of, I'm part of the group of 40 stakeholders and ODFW staff that came up with this plan. Uh, the plan uh, shows that uh, we can have limited harvest of wild steelhead. That harvest is a small factor in the health of a run. A lot of people today have testified that we should go to catch and release. Well, for 20 years and 30 years, there's rivers in Puget Sound and Central Oregon and the Washington coast that have had no harvest and the wild steelhead runs haven't made any improvement. We live in a special area of the state where our rivers originate in national forest area. We have good habitat. When ocean conditions are good, we tend to have strong runs harvest uh, only a small number of fish are harvested and uh, we can we can uh, sustain some wild harvest uh, i encourage the commission to trust the majority of the stakeholders <coughs> and the department of fish and wildlife staff's expert opinion and accept this plan with unanimous vote thank you thank you andy um janet jeffrey and then we'll go to harvey young harry piper and francis o young go ahead thank janet. You, Thank you, commissioners. My name is Janet Jeffrey. I'm a retired RN and healthcare administrator who chose to move here because of the fish. I believe in science, but I also believe in compromise. Moving to catch and release will have drastic trickle down effects on eateries, shops, markets, hotels, RV parks, state parks, and fishing guide businesses. But I see more. Ultimately, retirees like my husband and I will choose somewhere else to go post careers. That's going to mean they will buy their final homes somewhere else. They will spend their wealth somewhere else. They will donate their energy and volunteer time somewhere else. And they will get their health care somewhere else. So what people ask, Gold Beach real estate industry will decline. Local businesses will further fail. Volunteer dependent nonprofits which happen to be this region's social safety net, will fail. Local healthcare system will fail. Gold Beach will no longer be a quaint little fishing village. It will be a ghost town. Please avoid this predictable picture. Allow a reasonable catch and keep steelhead policy. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Harvey, Harvey Young. Here, Wall, we don't have Harvey or Francis in the room at this time. Then Harry Piper, you are it for this batch of three from the Zoom part. And then we'll go back to the courthouse for Lucy Labonte, um, Sam Waller, Neil Rogers. So go ahead, Harry. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, Chair Wall, members of the commission, Director Melcher, my name is Harry Piper. I live in Ashland, Oregon. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Rogue Fly Fishers, a club founded 50 years ago in Medford that today has almost 200 members. We've had several years of low steelhead runs on the whole west coast of North America and a particularly low run this year. While the run on the road was better than other rivers this year, the danger signs for the future of wild steelhead in Southwest Oregon are out there for all of us to see. Since the loss of the fish counting station at Gold Ray Dam, we've had a lack of hard data on the actual returns of wild steelhead to the road and there isn't any hard data on the rest of the rivers in Southwest Oregon either. With the danger signs out there and the lack of data, 
The only prudent course is to stop the harvest of wild winter steelhead until we can get a handle on what is going on. These wild fish have evolved over thousands of years to deal with changing habitats and climate conditions. If we stop the harvest of wild winter steelhead, we give more of them the chance to adapt to the changing conditions so that they can continue to survive and thrive. Why do we care so much about these wild steelhead? Well, they're legendary, written about from Zane Gray on down. And they're more accessible to the fishermen than hatchery fish, spreading out up and down the river instead of just zooming up to the hatchery. They comprise probably less than 40% of the runs on the road, but anecdotally at least account for more than 60% of the steelhead actually caught each year. They fight harder and are more beautiful than their hatchery cousins. People will come from all over the world to buy licenses and catch these magnificent wild fish, even though they can't keep them, just as is the case in British Columbia and on our own UMCO system. We urge the commission to adopt alternative two in the RSP, the catch and release only. This is not the time for business as usual. Don't let the demise of these beautiful creatures happen on your watch. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Let's go to Lucy Labonte and Sam Waller, Neil Rogers at the courthouse and then Jeffrey Frund, um, Mark Rockwell and Richard Dyer from, um, for the next three after that. And then um, Robert Berg and John Anderson from the courthouse again. So Lucy. Good morning, Lucy Labonte, 968645 Agnes Road. That's a third of the way up to Agnes on the Rogue River. I live on the Rogue River. Um, and I did review your Rogue South Coast Multi-Species Conservation Management Plan. That's a mouthful. I, cut, I helped write the Oregon plan for salmon and now salmon and watersheds. So um, I think we picked a good name back then. <laughs> but anyway, um, I did review your plan. I did see that the numbers of steelhead are down a little bit, but um, they're not at the caution, raise the red flag part right yet. Um, the numbers show that in the past few years, which were drought years here, um, yeah, that's when the numbers were down. Driving down the Rogue River today, I finally see the river full of water, the most, the most water I've seen um, this season, and we have many more giant storms on their way. This is really good for the fish. I tell people to move up here from California. We love our rain. We love our fish. Um, I was involved in fishery uh, management issues from 1989 to 2009 very strongly, including when um, Will Stell was petitioned to list the steelhead in the 1990s. I raised the red flag, actually Russ, Russ Stoff raised the red flag to me, and I went up to Kitzhopper's office and said, hey, we can't allow this listing. And he got a plan going with the fly fishermen, with everybody, to work on conservation measures while ODFW staff counted the steelhead and while uh, the fish managers in California counted the steelhead. Unfortunately, the fish managers in California didn't do such a good job. Um, so four years later, when a fly fisherman from Sacramento su uh, sued uh, National Marine Fishery Service and said, you have to make your decision now, um, they found there were more steelhead on the Rogue River than anywhere on the West Coast. And so they did not list us. I have faith in our ODFW staff that has been counting fish since the 1990s on the Rogue River. And those who don't think we have a count, I think you're misinformed because our ODFW staff is constantly counting. I'm over time, I thank you. I just wanted to assure those folks that we have good counts on the Rogue River. We are not in bad shape yet and I support this plan as written. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucy. Sam? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sam Waller, and I've lived here for 30 years. My family's owned a hotel here for the last 30 years. Um, and I just want to say, I'm also a guide. I've had a guide's license for 26 years. I'd like to add that my mom, who ran the hotel there, never took a salary in all 30 years. We couldn't really afford to. And I can tell you, I couldn't have afforded to live here without my guide's license. 
we had a situation where about two and a half months out of the year during the summer, you'd make enough money, you could put a little bit away. But I want to tell you, every every winter, we would go backwards to a point where my mom would have to take a loan on her house to, to do some roofing at the hotel. So I, I, from a business point of view, I just want you to know, we barely make it down here as it is. And when they listed the wild, or the, uh, told us we couldn't keep wild salmon during April and May, I can tell you from my guides thing, my business just dropped to nothing. So as far as someone saying that people come here from all over the world to fish for fish that they can't keep, I'm telling you, that's not true. My, my clientele went to nothing practically. And I'm not saying, you know, keep a bunch of fish. This one fish a day just allows a guy to come here, maybe spend, I had one guy tell me he spent $10,000 coming here to fish by the time he brought his family and everything and spent all the money. And to get them here, and I've had people come as far away as Tennessee every year that don't come anymore because they come here. And if you catch one or two fish and don't get to keep any, they're not coming back. I'm just telling you that. Um, and, and also, I don't even fish for wild steelhead because they're too hard to catch. Like you said, right now it's up and high. You won't catch them. It's going to be low and clear next week. You won't catch them. It, to allow someone to keep one fish is not asking for too much, I don't think. And again, we trust our ODFW here. We want to see the fish healthy, but that, that's kind of my point. I'm out of time. I could keep talking, trust me, but uh, I think I've wasted <laughs> enough of your time. <laughs> Thank you for your brevity, Sam. Neil Rogers. Good morning. Um, my name is Neil Rogers. I live in Brookings. Uh, I've been there since 2001. I uh, am a board member on the Oregon South Coast Fishermen. Uh, I've been a member uh, since 2002. So I'm active in the club and it's a step uh, program. Um, I have the the appropriate canned uh, message to with a little bit of modification. Over 40 combined ODFW staff and stakeholders worked for over two years to produce the most comprehensive plan ever written by an inclusive and unbiased and balanced group of stakeholders. ODF and W expert opinion and data illustrate that sport fishing has no effect on the viability of these fish. I encourage the commission to trust the majority of stakeholders and ODF and W expert staff opinion and accept this plan with a unanimous vote. Please follow our proven successful model of conservation and not pseudoscience from outside sources, no matter how well meaning. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. We'll go to Jeffrey Frund, uh, Mark Rockwell, and Richard Dyer. Michelle, are, in, are those people here? Mark Rockwell is in the room. Great. The other two are not. Go ahead, Mark. Hello, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Charles Mark Rockwell. I'm a longtime fisherman in Oregon for more than 40 years. I represent the Northern California Council Fly Fishers International, our 24 fly fishing clubs, and more than 7,000 active fly fishing members in California. Our members fish annually in Oregon for both steelhead and rainbow trout. I've heard from scores of these fishermen who regularly fish in Oregon for winter steelhead. They have told me the fishing in Oregon for winter steelhead is on the decline. And that has been my experience as well over the last eight years. They wanted me to tell you that Oregon needs to protect these special fish. They all tell me if there is no change, they likely will no longer travel to Oregon in the winter. I wanna give you one personal story. I and three other very experienced steelhead fishermen who have fished the entire west coast of North America for these fish. Fished last winter in Southern Oregon on the Rogue and Sixes River for winter steelhead. In seven days of fishing between the four of us, we hooked only one fish, a totally dismal number. We collectively spent more than $12,000 in Oregon on this trip. If you want anglers to travel and support businesses in Oregon and come and recreate in your great state, you need to make a change in fishing regulations to stop the take, at least for now, of winter steelhead. Catch and release for winter steelhead is both appropriate and needed. We are all interested in protecting these fish, but you on the commission hold the reins on regulation to make this happen. 
I also would like to make a comment on people who say the numbers of fish are counted every year. That is not true. The in migrating spawning steelhead numbers in Southern Oregon rivers are not measured. There would be ways to measure them but until the ODFW takes the opportunity to move to distance sonar devices or devices like that to measure the incoming spawning fish. You have no idea what the numbers are or what the trend is. So thank you, I appreciate this opportunity. Please move to catch and release fishing for wild winter steelhead. Thank you, Charles. Um, we'll go to the um, courthouse for Robert Berg and John Anderson. Michelle, are Richard Dyer or, um, well, is Richard Dyer back? I have not seen Richard enter the room. Okay, then we'll go to the um, courthouse for Robert Berg and John Anderson. And then we'll go to Rachel Andrus and Holden Korish. And then back to the courthouse for Michael Simmons, Maury Hammers, and Brenda Hammers. So Robert Berg. Robert Berg couldn't be with us. He had to leave early. He uh, didn't make the time slot. He wanted to give uh, testimony to support the plan, support Harvest of Wild Winter Steelhead. So here is John Anderson. And in the interest of time, I can find a backup to replace uh, our absentee there, Robert Berg. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'm speaking on behalf for Greg Eide. He has a great concern about fish that get hooked to me. I fished with Greg for 10 years before I started guiding. I've known him for 35 years. And uh, he always gave us a choice of whether we wanted to keep them or not. And now and then you will hook a fish and it's a bleeder. And uh, he would like to be, well, you know, we always kept the bleeders. And if it was a wild animal and you shot a wild animal and you just let him die out in the woods or bleed out, you get a ticket for a wasting game animal. And therefore, I think that we need to look at this from a uh, perspective that uh, we need to be smart on our harvest. These fly fishermen would like to catch a relief. Let them. Who's stopping them? Most of these speakers I hear, I've never seen them in the lower 10 miles of the river, and I've been on it for 35 years. And uh, they're trying to convince you to make decisions, not even in their own backyard. So I. For the courthouse, we lost audio. Yep. All right. If we don't listen to our biologists, we're telling them they're you know, doing a lousy job. And uh, I'd like just to be in support of them. And Greg does too, with the one and three, for especially when we hook a fish too deep and it's bleeding and that we should be able to keep it. So we're not wasting game animal or fish. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, then let's go to... We've got, uh, we've got in the interest of time, George Lewis to take the place of Robert Berg, if he may. He's signed up for the Clay County Forum. Actually, I'll, I'll come right back to that person, but we, we have somebody already started, Rachel Andrus, and then we'll come right back to your, your substitute person, okay? Uh, go ahead, Rachel. Thank you, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name's Rachel Andrus and I live in Talent, Oregon. Last month, I spoke about how fishing is meaningful to us all. That is what we have in common. Fishing is a way many of us feel grounded and alive. I also spoke of our own family small business and how the lack of wild steelhead will affect all aspects of our communities. Today, I'm speaking about responsibility and accountability. You are making a monumental decision about the future of these wild adult steelhead without the information you need. Yet, ODFNW has not provided any accurate data on adult return and numbers and where we even stand at this point. 
This is not new information. We've been asking for this for some time and we need to be accountable. Yes, it takes money and it takes time, but it's necessary. Our current reality is unknown and utilizing juvenile return readings and trends are not enough to make an educated decision. The trends are not in favor of the fish. How about we also look at what we're measuring to avoid closing our fisheries? It is much easier to sell fishing licenses and run small businesses when there are wild adult steelhead returning. Just drive a little north to other rivers and you will see what we're up against. The trends alone concerning drought and ocean changes are terrifying for all fish. So I ask you to please demand ODFNW biologists and volunteers, my family included, <laughs> to collect accurate data for adult wild winter steelhead immediately for the next five years and adopting the catch and release policy on the Southern Oregon coast. It is your responsibility and we trust you. We have to know where we are to know where we're going. And anyone with a pulse here will agree that if there are no fish, there is no opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Let's go back to the courthouse for the person who's substituting for Robert Berg. And then we'll go to Holden Korish, and then Michael Simmons and Maury Hammers and Brenda Hammers. So back to the courthouse for the person who's substituting for Robert Berg. My name is George Lewis. Uh, lived here my whole life on the Rogue River. And uh, believe it or not, there is no shortage down here on the, the steelhead. And there's only a few places along the lower river where people even fish. It's gravel bars. That's it. It ain't like there's a army of people out here trying to wipe out the fish population. I mean, there's a few people fishing for these wild steelhead and the hatchery. They're not wiping them out. And if whoever's trying to say that that's what's going on is 100% wrong. It's not happening like that at all. I mean, I wish you were here and you could go down to the river bars and see what's actually going on. It's not being wiped out by the people fishing. So why is everybody trying to take away a privilege and make it so that what if you catch a wild fish and you did hook it in the gill and it is definitely going to die. You're just going to throw it back in the river and let it float away. I mean, the retention thing, they're allowing three fish. That's a good thing. The OD8 FNW guys around here, we all know them. They have been at it longer than, I mean, credit 20 years of some of them and stuff like that. They know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They're, it ain't no joke. These guys, we have 100% confidence now. And I wish that uh, the, well, I guess the fly fishermen or whoever it is would pay attention to what they have to say. They know what they're talking about. And apparently these guys need to start paying attention to what in the heck they're telling them. It's, it's, it's like the over and over and over push and take the fish away. Well, if you take the fish away, you're just going to be throwing dead fish in the river because there's already down to three. Come on now. Open your eyes, people. There ain't a whole bunch of people down here just slaughtering and stealing. So that's about all I have to say. But it's really getting to the point that you people need to trust your OGF and W. The professionals and they do count fish whether you see it or not have a good day thank you and just to be clear that was george lewis i think was it did i get the name right yes thank you let's go to holden korish then yeah. michael simmons maury hammers brenda hammers holden here wall holden is not in the room then we're at the courthouse for michael simmons Hello, um, my name is Michael Simmons, and I've been living here about 30 years, and uh, I've been fishing the river all 30 years, and uh, uh, I've been transmitting the, my, I'm the oldest of 175 uh, children, great-grandchildren, and great-great and great-great-great-grandchildren, and I teach them all to fish, 
and be responsible. And uh, I know that from uh, October to January, not very many people fish the river. So there's about, you know, three months or so, three and a half months where the fish just run up the river and nobody fishes for them and my family. And then uh, in January, we know we can keep the fish. So we fish in January and we don't keep more fish than we need. And, we, and the kids, they love to go down there together and fish. They really enjoy fishing down there. And they don't want to go down there and kill the fish. They just, they want to keep a few of them and hang out and just talk. And, and uh, if you, you stop them from being able, being able to keep the fish, they'll stop fishing down there. And uh, I love my grandchildren and all of my uh, grandchildren's friends. I've watched them grow up and they fish together down there and I go down there and fish with them. And I can go down there uh, and catch a fish a lot of times in five minutes. I'll be there five minutes and I'll catch a fish. And uh, I've been, the fishing population isn't, isn't down real low like they're saying. There's a lot of fish going up that river. I've watched hundreds of fish go by. When I sit down there, you just watch them, giant schools of fish going by. I mean, one right after the other. And uh, you're not always catching them because they don't always bite. But uh, uh, the, if you know how to fish for them and you've been fishing as long as I have, you can catch a fish. But uh, a fly fisherman is not going to catch very many fish in the Rogue River in the wintertime because they just don't bite flies that good in the, in the wintertime. Now, in the summer, you can. But uh, I think that they should leave things the way they are right now. Um, uh, the fishing is not uh, in trouble right now. I mean, and that's pretty much what I'll, all I got to say. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Thank you. Let's go to Maury Hammers and then Brenda Hammers. And then we'll go to Josh Pruden, Vince Martino, and Seth Eisenberg. Hi, <clears throat> Hi I'm Maury Hammers. I live in Brookings. And I would ask that the commission accept the recommendations of ODF and W. <clears throat> it seems like there's been a lot of time, effort, and taxpayer dollars that have uh, been spent getting to where we are at this point. So I would ask that they accept this. And uh, for those people that want to catch and release, um, let them catch and release. Thank you. Thank you, Maury. Brenda? And let me just mention that we'll, we'll take three more people after Brenda um, the, from Zoom, and then two from the courthouse, and then we'll take a break for lunch. So Brenda, and then Josh, Vince, Seth. Go ahead, Brenda. Chair Wall, can I ask a question? If people are not testifying, can they mute and go off screen so that we can focus on the people that are testifying? Yes, sure. Thank you. That's just protocol that we would be doing if we were live. Thank you, Commissioner, yes. We'll let people know that. Um, Brenda, go ahead. Okay, I'm Brenda Hammers. <clears throat> I'm a five-year resident of Brookings, Oregon, and a 52-year resident of Oregon. I'm also a member of the Oregon South Coast Fishermen Club, and I like to catch fish. I've seen a lot of changes in Oregon over the years, and not necessarily for the best, and my trust in government has been eroding. I believe the plan the stakeholders and ODF staff have collaborated on for over two years should be implemented for those who like to fish, for those whose livelihoods depend on it, and for those of our local businesses who depend on it in the winter. With the ongoing pandemic, life is tough enough. Please don't add any more misery to the place we call home. Please listen to your stakeholders, your own ODFW staff, and pass the plan with a unanimous vote and help restore some trust in my government and state. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Josh Pruden, Vince Martino, Seth Eisenberg. 
Michelle, are those three people in the room? We have Josh and Seth in the room. Vince is not. Thank Can you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Go okay. ahead. Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Josh Pruden and I live in Brookings, Oregon. My passion for wild steelhead started years ago on the banks of the wild and scenic watersheds that line the south, the southern Oregon coast. As mentioned by others, we do not have definitive figures in regard to necessary escapement in order to allow for thriving wild steelhead populations in southern Oregon. And not knowing is too high of a risk for these fisheries to function on. The economic and recreational value of steelhead fishing in Southern Oregon is far too important to not have support from scientifically backed data. In order to ensure this, at this time, it appears a move to catch and release of wild steelhead in Southern Oregon is necessary. During this period, it will be essential to analyze the current state of these fish and make a data informed decision. A move to catch and release will ensure the potential for future anglers to experience the pursuit of these magnificent fish. It will also be an integral part in decreasing the likelihood of closures, in turn creating more angling opportunity for the people visiting and living in the region. Let's give these fish a voice and support the release of wild steelhead in southern Oregon. Please adopt alternative two for catch and release of wild steelhead. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Josh. Seth, and then we'll take two more people from the courthouse, John Meyer and Anne, I think it's Basin, um, and then we'll take a break for lunch. So um, Seth, go ahead. Yep, can you hear me all right? Yes. Perfect, thank you. So <clears throat> I've spent 20 years as a director with Trout Unlimited, currently with the Deschutes Red Band chapter in Bend. I'm also trained as a biologist. Uh, my undergraduate degree is from Cornell in Natural Resources Management. Uh, the thrust of my testimony today is to really reinforce the idea of why wild <clears throat> steelhead retention is a very bad idea in Oregon's South Coast and why catch and release should be instituted at least for the next three to five years. You've been asked by many here to follow the science and the guidance by ODFW biologists. I think the big question that you have in front of you is this, you know, is the data sufficient is the monitoring sufficient? And do you feel confident in that data to be able to take an aggressive approach relative to the retention of wild steelhead? Much of the data that we rely on and the general framework is based on the Klamath Mountains Province Summer Steelhead Study, which is almost 20 years old now. Um, ODFW has recently picked up monitoring uh, in the South Coast um, for REDS, et cetera, but that's in recognition largely of the fact that there's insufficient data and monitoring at this time. So we're playing catch up. Um, you know, I'm not opposed for us revisiting this in three to five years, but I just don't think that there's anything that really would present the sufficient data to stand on to really take, the, take more than the most conservative approach, which would be to go to catch and release at this time. The other thing I guess I would point out in my closing here is we're related to the economic side of things. We do wanna keep folks in Curry County on board with this. I do think that the note relative to closures, et cetera, that might be necessary, given the trend line for West Coast Steelhead, especially in Oregon, is, you know, a bellwether and something that really needs to be watched. However, I just think that, you know, we're all going to have to wrap our heads around what these fish need at this time. Appreciate the time today. Look forward to your deliberation and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Seth. Let's go to the courthouse again for John Meyer and Ann. Basin. Chair Wall, John Meyer, and Ann Basin, uh, they had to leave. They uh, were prepared to stay till afternoon, uh, although they did want to weigh in on this and ask that uh, the commission support the plan as proposed and, of course, uh, advocate for the har one and three harvest of wild winter steelhead, the only harvest alternative, I might add. There are no other alternatives in the plan. But in the interest of time, I've got a couple of more people here up to bat, uh, Rick Howard and Ted Burnett. Go ahead, Rick. <clears throat> thank you, commissioners, and uh, thank you for uh, hearing our testimonies. And uh, um, 
I'm uh, 71 years old. I was born and raised in Bannon. My dad was born and raised in Bannon in 1926, lived there his whole life. And uh, we uh, have fished uh, the South Coast streams uh, our whole lives. And, uh, you know, um, we've seen good years and we've seen poor years and we've seen ups and downs. And uh, um, we, um, uh, you know, have seen it all. Um, the last few years, we've had, you know, pretty much uh, low water conditions, which means the fish uh, seem to hide real well on low water conditions. And uh, <clears throat> some people say they can't catch them. It's because the fish, you know, are pretty evasive. The, uh, um, if you take a look outside right now, we've got uh, uh, quite a bit of water coming down. We've got a lot of river flow. We've got a lot of escapement going on. And uh, so we're going to see. Um, uh, a real bump in uh, fish propagation. The, um, <clears throat> the numbers of fish actually harvested on the, the road basin was like 5% of the wild population. <clears throat> that means 95% of the fish that actually came in over the last several years have spawned naturally and have escaped and are, you know, produced juveniles that uh, uh, come for future generations now. And then the other thing is, is that 17% of the habitat that these fish go through is, is only reachable with fishermen. That means 83% of the habitat these fish swim through is not accessible to fishermen. So to do a closure on uh, the ability to harvest 5%, of a wild run that has, um, you know, a, a huge opportunity for escapement on their own seems a little bit of a knee jerk. Um, I'm not afraid to release wild fish. I have released a number of wild fish in my day, but I'm not afraid to kill one and eat one. They're absolutely delicious. So um, I would um, advocate that uh, we maintain a one and three and that you would adopt that. And uh, thank you for your time. Is, thank you. The substitute for Anne is ready. Go ahead, Pat. I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Ted Burdett. I am currently a teacher and uh, my greatest fear of this nuclear option regarding retention of wild steelhead is that this decision, much like other decisions made before it regarding our state's natural resources, is not based upon science, but is based upon emotional knee-jerk reactions and agendas. There are those who have substituted science with their own political or extreme environmentalist philosophies and agendas. I believe it is those people who are driving the driving force behind shutting down our rivers, lakes, and forests to virtually all human activity. For them, a footprint in the forest is an abomination of nature. To the best of my knowledge, the wild steelhead population on the Rogue River is healthy and vibrant. What is increasingly threatened is the sportsman. I hate that description, sportsman. For many in the audience, hunting and the outdoor world is not sport. It is a way of life and a culture that is under constant attack and misrepresentation. If the population is at a sustainable yield, based upon studies done by dedicated professional field workers hired by the ODFW, then scientific logic demands that those practices be continued, which allowed for this successful program to succeed. This is my fear. Today, the effort is to eliminate retention of wild steelhead. Tomorrow, it will be to eliminate the retention of wild Chinook. Then the elimination of hatcheries will occur, and at that point, you will see the extinct, uh, extinction of the fishermen and fisherwoman. A rich cultural heritage will be reduced to history books and distorted Disney characterizations. Remember, it wasn't long ago where we had a governor who wished to shut down the borders of Oregon to marine activities and harvests. His extremist ideas were rejected and he became politically impotent. However, his disciples of environment extremism live on cloaked in suits and fashion of outdoor attire. Rely upon science, study the hatchery programs and revolutionize them to best mimic natural conditions in order to increase the overall fitness of all anadromous species. 
We can all survive and thrive through science and cooperation, not through condemnation and environmental genocide targeting the sportsmen. Thank you for your time, Ted Burdett. Thank you. When we come back, the first people will be Shandy Danford, Will Postman, and Aaron Vaughn. Then at the courthouse, Harry, Henry Simmons, Kay Krug, and Mike Krug. And if I could, I would like to remind you that we did ask if people will really give us the information you want us to hear to make these decisions. And if we can um, limit um, comments about other commenters, um, that would be great. So thank you. And we will be back um, at one.
Mary, I just want to say you and um, Michelle are doing an awesome job of keeping this going. I don't know how you do it. Or no, Michelle. I, this feels a little, you know, disjointed with the two, but you know, it gives people a chance to get on the line. So that's great. Yeah, but you're keeping it moving and, and uh, we're hearing a lot of good testimony. So I don't know, you guys need some awards in the time of COVID for all this. <laughs> well, thank it's, you. It's one thing to do this if we were all in person uh, where you could actually see the people, but when you can't even see them and Michelle's I know. over, it's a, it's, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I'm glad everybody can stay with this. So we'll just, we'll get going again. Um, Welcome back everyone. I think we're ready to start again. So I'd like to restart the December 16th, um, 2021 um, Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting to hear testimony from people talking about the Rogue South Coast Conservation and Management Plan. And we're ready to start with um, Shandy Danford, Will Poston, and Aaron Vaughn on Zoom. And then Henry Simmons, Kay Krug, and Mike Krug on uh, from the courthouse and I really appreciate everybody staying with it and with us through this day and so many of you testifying and to the commissioners, um, thank you for, for giving this day to hear all this testimony. So let's go ahead and start again, um, Shandy. Michelle, is Shandy um, Danford in the Shandy is in the room. Um, Shandy, I wasn't able to pull you over, but I, you just need to unmute and you'll be able to speak, but you won't have access to your camera. I'm sorry. Maybe <clears throat> we can give Shandy just a, a minute by going to Will Poston then, and we'll come right back to Shandy Danford. So Will, are you available? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair Wall and uh, members of the commission. Um, my name is Will Poston, and I'm from the, the East Coast. I'm not a Pacific Northwesterner, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm commenting on this issue and specifically in support of catch and release um, in hopes of one day making it out and fishing these rivers. I, I want to swing the, swing the majestic rivers of the Northwest and, you know, have some resemblance of an opportunity of encountering these fish. I know, I know it's, you know, not easy for anyone to catch these fish, but in, 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 in the future, I want to have that opportunity. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot of today is, you know, everyone's talking about um, the best available science or lack thereof. And I just want to highlight that, you know, without good monitoring and without good data, fishery managers just have to be pre precautionary and conservative in nature. Um, that's, that's a tenet that's followed all across the country in terms of fisheries management. Um, you know, if, the, if we don't have the fish in the future, then there's no opportunity for anyone. Um, so we, we have to prioritize the opportunity now to keep fish um, in the system and keep wild fish in the system uh, so we can deal with all these other threats that we're talking about, whether it's climate change, ocean conditions, other habitat, um, you name it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's going to be my comment. I'll try to keep, I tried to keep it short. Um, you know, I'm, I've been on, on this, uh, webinar for three and a half hours right now. I don't, I didn't want to be, do this, but I'm doing it because I, I care about these fish that I, I hope to, uh, hope to encounter in, uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, let's try again for Shandy. Are you there, Shandy? And unmuted? I think that she's having troubles getting unmuted. Um, okay, I'm, then we'll, we'll go to Aaron Vaughn. And Michelle, if you could just let me know if Shandy gets ready soon. Aaron Vaughn. And Aaron is not in the room at this time. That makes that. Then we go to Henry Simmons, Kay Krug, and Mike Krug at the courthouse. And then we'll come back to Charles Hammerstad, Mark Rogers, and Andrew Wood. So Henry Simmons. Chair Wall, Henry Simmons had to go to work, but uh, he wanted to let us know he advocates for the 
draft proposal and the harvest of wild winter steelhead. And I'll uh, pass the mic to Kay and Mike Crew. <coughs> Go ahead. I'm going, to, I'm, a, I'm going to give you a two for as uh, Mike had to leave to go to Brookings. We were here since nine o'clock. Commissioners, I can't stress enough the value of this opportunity for you to hear from people who are outside of your bubble that you hear from every day. Many of us who are testifying at the courthouse today would not participate in a commission meeting because of how they're being done electronically or in other areas well outside of where we live. But we showed up today because we actually live here. We interact with our ODFW staff. They actually talk and listen to us and we support the plan they have worked over two years on. We also support harvest of wild winter steelhead. Let us retain a choice of keeping a sustainable number of fish or releasing them as many of us do. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. And I think I understood you that you spoke also for Mike Krug. That's correct. He had a doctor's appointment. We've been here since nine, though. And I'm sorry that it is taking so long. These these hearings do take that a lot of time. Um, can we go back to Shandy? Is Shandy available? No, nope, still working on the issue. Okay, Charles Hammerstead then, and then Mark Rogers and Andrew Wood. And while we're waiting for Charles to start, the next three from the, um, the courthouse would be Lawrence Smith, Jean Trinkler, and Larry Smith. So Charles Hammerstead. Charles is not in the room. And Mark Rogers or Andrew Wood. Give me just a second. I was working on Shandy's connection, but I'll move people over just a moment. Sure, thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> the meeting software is not allowing me to promote people to panelists, but it is allowing me to let them have access to their microphones. So um, both Shandy and Mark, um, you have access to your microphone. And to both of you, our apologies, of course, for the for not having your picture as well, but we would love to hear from you. So go ahead, Shandy. So Mark, are you available then? And Michelle, what about Andrew Wood? Hello, uh, Mark Rogers, can you hear Go me? Go ahead, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Chair Wall, commissioners and Director Melcher, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Mark Rogers and I live on the Sandy River near Sandy, Oregon. As chair of the Oregon Council of Trout Unlimited, I represent 4,000 members of Trout Unlimited in Oregon, including members and friends who live near and fish and guide on the South Coast streams. We support a moratorium on the retention of wild steelhead in the Rogue and South Coast streams as outlined in Alternative 2, Catch and Release for Decision 3.1 of the RSP. We are all aware of the recent low steelhead runs in many Oregon watersheds. More disturbing is the decades long decline of steelhead runs across the Pacific Northwest. Everyone here, commissioners, ODFW staff, and public participants wish to fix this. It is a challenging task. Wild steelhead have a complex and varied life cycle. This along with the challenges of climate change and habitat loss creates difficulty in predicting populations. The best we can do in response is to collect appropriate and ample data, both prior to and after we implement management decisions. Wild steelhead management decisions should be based on accepted metrics of adult population estimates, escapement goals, and expected mortality. As a steelhead angler, I understand the desire to bring home this gift of the sea. Most wild winter steelhead harvest on the south coast occurs in the Chetco and Rogue Rivers, both of which have adequate hatchery fish to provide harvest opportunities 
for myself and my fellow anglers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Oregon Trout Unlimited looks forward to the adoption of catch and release regulations for wild winter steelhead for the first five years of the RSP or until ODFW collects the data necessary to make an informed, sustainable harvest decision. This is unfortunate but necessary action, which will help to ensure that we have abundant wild steelhead in southwestern Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and for staying with us. Um, we'll go to Andrew Wood, if he's available. Andrew? Then I think we'll, we, we will try to come back to Andrew Wood and Shandy one more time. And in the meantime, we'll go to Lawrence Smith, Gene Trinkler, and Larry Smith at the courthouse. And then um, the next two people after that would be Josh Lusher and Danan Hurst, or Kirst. So um, Lawrence Smith at the courthouse. Uh, I'm... This is Joe Janowitz and Larry had to leave and also uh, Tom Hawkins he was on, the, on our list as well and uh, they both had to leave. Uh, I'm going to testify for both those gentlemen. Um, good morning and thanks. Uh, this is for Tom Hawkins. Good morning and thanks for giving folks in Gold Beach the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Tom Hawkins and I'm a sixth generation Curry County resident living in Gold Beach most of my 69 years. And my kids and grandkids have been hunting and fishing here for that uh, as long as they've been alive. I've participated in the stakeholder group where a lot of people spent an awful lot of time working hard to come up with a plan that all stakeholders could agree on, only to have some stakeholders have a last minute change of heart I represent Curry Citizens for Public Land Access, which is a volunteer group that does road and trail work, trying to maintain access to public lands. I encourage you to follow the plan that the stakeholder group agreed upon. Anything less completely undermines that process. I support keeping three wild steelhead and one per day. I've seen many families on the gravel bars fishing and enjoyed watching the children fight the fish It'd be a shame to not let these young folks harvest their fish, whereas allowing harvest would encourage new and young anglers such as these to take up fishing for the rest of their lives. Also, the reality is that some of the folks out there fishing are having a hard time and being able to keep a wild fish occasionally literally helps them survive. Further reduction in winter steelhead harvest opportunities would hurt our local economy as well as reduce funding to ODFW through license and tag sales. I also support the use of our hatcheries and would like to see the hatchery program fully utilized. Again, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Catch and release should be the angler's choice. The plan we work so hard on retains the opportunity to keep a few wild fish. And since ODFW data clearly shows that sport fishing is not impacting viability of these species in Southwest Oregon, there's no valid reason to restrict it further. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, if, you're welcome, that was for Tom Hawkins. And then briefly, uh, Larry asked me to speak for him and say that he supports the one in three harvest and the ODFW plan because the science supports it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jean Trinkler. Yes, I'm John. I'm filling in for Gene. And we were wondering if you commissioners got from our county commissioners a letter about two and a half pages long. And it also in the letter is about a 30 page summary of all the fish catch at Huntley Park showing the numbers over the years and how that were on, on above a 10 year average in it. Did you guys get a chance to look at that? We did get it and um, have spoken with a couple of the commissioners about it. So the county commissioners. So yes, we have it, um, the letter and the material. Great. And uh, <clears throat> that was about it. And we're in favor of, he was in favor of the one and three. Thank you. Um, have a great day. You too. Thank you very much. Um, 
Larry Smith was the other person from the courthouse. Sir Wallace is letting it again, and I think we're out of testimonies here at the county courthouse. I want to thank you for giving us the time and to really give you the local flavor of the Curry County citizens and the Curry County Commission here. You know, we're a little rough around the edges, but we're working class, and but we do know what's going on with our fisheries. So thank you again, and thank you for all that you do. And to all of you for staying with us for this whole thing and for all the work you've done on this. Um, so we will go to next to, um, it looks like um, Duncan Kirst is here and also um, Josh Lusher, and then Peter Tronquet and Dave Lacey. So go ahead, Duncan. And then if Josh Lusher is here, it would be next. Go ahead, Duncan. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit today. And uh, I live in Portland. I moved to Oregon in 1995. Before that, I spent 20 years in Alaska. And I've been adjusting to the uh, new regime of fishing in Oregon for the last 23 years. And uh, anyway, thank you for allowing me to participate. Um, generally, I like to spend my money in Oregon and, uh, you know, I buy equipment here. I buy my license here. I go down and fish in various places and but the main concern I have is really for the fish. And um, I would like to say that I support option A, which is catch and release. And uh, it's interesting to note that a lot of these rivers have hatcheries, which you're allowed under the option A to keep. Uh, and only the wild fish would be released. So I think that seems reasonable. Uh, Personally, when I go fishing, I uh, let everything go. Uh, and I use single barbless hooks. And I keep the fish in the water and uh, I make sure they're okay when I let them go. So um, I think that really today we're concentrating on one of the four pillars of difficulties uh, affecting steelhead. One is hatcheries. The other is hydroelectricity. The other is habitat. And lastly, there is the harvest. So really, this is only a small part of the entire picture that threatens steelhead in Oregon. Um, and I think it's the least we can do right now to uh, allow catch and release. And if people want to catch, keep their hatchery steelhead, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I look forward to continuing my efforts at fishing in Oregon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to Peter Tronquet and Dave Lacey. We have Peter and or Dave. And after them would be Dean Pollan, Alex Schoen, Sandra Colvard. So Peter Tronquet. While we're waiting for him, I see it looks like Dave Lacey is in on the list. So go ahead, Dave, and, and then we'll circle right back to Peter Tronquet. All right. Hello, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. Uh, my name is Dave Lacey. I have lived in the Gold Beach area since 1995, and I decided to stay here and raise my family. I also started a guide and outfitter business back in 2012. So thank you for this opportunity to voice my opinion. Uh, we do need this plan for the South Coast and I support it and I support the monitoring under the plan, especially. I think that's very, very needed. And um, however, I do feel like we need to add catch and release regulations for wild fish for at least five years or until ODF and W get sufficient data to make a limited harvest decision. I'd also like to see catch and release mortality be factored in when considering that limited harvest. I feel so fortunate to live here. Um, I fish almost daily during steelhead season, mostly on the smaller streams, but when the water gets low, I do hit the bigger rivers like the Chetco and the Rogue. Um, but for me, it's more of a whole stream experience rather than catching and uh, killing a fish. I do like to eat fish and I do so occasionally. 
Um, I do love to have fish on my line, of course, but sometimes just seeing a family of otters or a beaver at hard at work or a kingfisher work in the branches over the creek, um, sometimes that's enough for me to enjoy my experience. I do worry quite a bit about the lack of data and the perception of declining stocks that we're, we're having around here. Um, so with good data come good decision making. I'm super confident in my local staff, the ODF and W staff, to make those good decisions when they have that data that's needed. But I don't think we're there right now. Um, I think both sides of this argument want the same thing. We all want wild and abundant steelhead and harvest opportunities, and I think we can get there. We just need this data and we need to give the fish a chance. Um, while we are on the Wild Rivers Coast, we are very isolated here, but we are not insulated to things that have happened in other places around the country. So I think that can happen here if we're not careful, and I'd like to just be precautionary. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dave. Um, is Peter Tonke? Peter is not in the room. Dave is not in the room, and Bill was not in the room. Um, you, I've, you're going really fast. Well, Mark Dave Keen was Dave Keen was a duplicate. He had already spoken, okay. and there was another Bill Divens who already spoke. So I assumed that it was the same person, okay. and somehow his name got on there twice. Okay. So Mark Rogers had an opportunity to testify. Yes. I haven't been able to keep up. And Josh Lusher. Okay. And so now no. we're to Dean Pollen. We did not hear from Josh Lusher. And okay. if he's there, let's go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. Looks like you're there. And then we will go to Dean Pollen, Alex Schoen, Sandra Colvard. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, you guys have heard it all. Thank you for being there today. Scratch my original speech. I support catch and release for wild steelhead. I just ask you guys to listen to your hearts. If your heart tells you that the continued killing of wild steelhead is ethical and sustainable, then that's what it is. If your heart tells you to do everything in your power to ensure the survival of a Northwest icon, then please embrace the change. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And we will go to Dave Pollan, Alex Schoen, Sandra Colvard, and the next three after that would be um, Sean Connors, Bruce Skinner and Stan Steele. So Dean. Dean is not in the room. I'm working on trying to get Shan, um, Sandra moved over. Okay. There we go. She's the next one we have available. Okay, Sandra, go ahead. Can we try for Sean Connors? then and Bruce Skinner, Stan Steele. Uh, Sean Connors is not here and I'm trying to get Bruce moved into the room. Okay. We'll just wait a minute for... Okay. There we go. Sandra Culver now looks like she's in the room. Let's go ahead, Sandra. Okay, I'm sorry. My name is Sandy Colvard. My husband, Victor and I are Oregon residents living on the Lower Rogue. We have fly fished extensively for steelhead in the Pacific Northwest and BC rivers for over 20 years. The decline in steelhead populations, especially wild steelhead in all rivers is noticeable and alarming. Arguably sports fishing is only one of many factors contributing to their demise, but it's the one we can do something about. Victor joins me in advocating for alternative to catch and release of wild winter steelhead, accompanied by best practices regulations, including artificial flies, single barbless hooks, and keeping the fish in the water at all times to help reduce mortality. And for those who want to eat their catch, the Coal M Rivers hatchery releases more steelhead than any other hatchery on the Oregon coast making for plenty of fish available for the, the grill or the freezer. Disturbingly, relative to the rogue and southern Oregon coast rivers, ODFW has no comprehensive scientific data, either in wild steelhead numbers returning to these rivers or harvest rates on which to base its management decisions. Clearly decisions based on no science is nonsense. Monitoring, uh, Adult population programs and mandatory harvest reporting by anglers should be immediately instituted so that a scientific basis may be developed for making future informed management decisions. 
don't wait for a winter steelhead population crisis before proactive measures are taken. Put the steelhead first over stakeholders. Please protect the remaining magnificent wild steelhead. Thank you for allowing us to share our thoughts. Thank you, Sandy. And so we'll go to Bruce Skinner if he's available or- uh, Ann, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. I'd, first, I'd like to thank the commission for taking public comment on this. My name is Bruce Skinner, and I live in Bend, Oregon. I am a board member of the Wild Steelhead Coalition, and I am providing public comment today on behalf of our members of the, in the South Coast and those who travel to fish these incredible watersheds each season. We are anglers and conservationists advocating for responsible angling opportunities with the goal of protecting diverse and abundant wild steelhead populations for the future. Today, I am asking the commission to take the opportunity to support alternative two, catch and release for wild winter steelhead when they vote tomorrow on the RSP. It is widely understood and supported by the department's own monitoring of juvenile fish that wild steelhead numbers on the Oregon South Coast rivers are in decline. But instead of protecting these key species to rebuild populations, the department is proposing to continue harvesting wild steelhead, even though they don't know how many adults are returning or even how many are being killed each season. And unlike Washington and Idaho, or even elsewhere in Oregon, these proposed fisheries completely and conspicuously neglect the accidental mortalities associated with catch and release angling. This, these are glaring emissions, which climate change impacting steelhead ocean survival and freshwater productivity now is a perfect moment to pause with the harvest of wild steelhead to make sure we do not accidentally harm these populations excessively or further impede their ability to sustain themselves in a long term. Faced with such profound data gaps and climate driven uncertainty, continuing to kill wild steelhead is simply too much of a risk to take. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we'll go to Stan Steele next, then Sophia K Kaoki, um, and then Michael McLean, George Grinzewitz. A um, couple names I think I didn't do well on, but we'll get them when they introduce themselves. Um, Stan Steele. Good afternoon, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. I'm Stan Steele, native-born Oregonian, lifelong angler, hunter, and trapper. As we sit here zooming, I hear the report of shots coming from waterfowl hunters on the surrounding wetlands. The irony of allowing hunting of wild birds and game mammals, based on the best available science and professional opinions for a state biologist, is deemed sufficient to establish seasons and bag limits for those harvestable species but that the best available science and their professional opinions are insufficient to set seasons and bag limits for wild steelhead. The irony is not lost on me. Organs of biologists are our boots on the ground experts, nationally recognized fishery management professionals and based their decisions in conservation. For some to say that ODFW failed to monitor and evaluate SAM on at harvest and distinct populations is patently untrue. This unfounded assertion devalues, disrespects, and questions the professional integrity of our managers and is in direct conflict with tenant number six of the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. Science is the proper tool to manage policy and our professional biologists are our experts. For those who are making the assertion that ODFW does not have any qualified science, I'd like to ask them to look at stream code 54141, Coquille River on, in, on stream net. Sufficient data for the Northwest. And, and these are data that's standardized, shared by cooperative states, tribes, and these are what do drive a lot of our decision-making processes. Will there ever be enough science to completely remove all risk from fish management policy? No. Stakeholder processes have a definite, definite protocol to them, and ODFW followed that protocol very well in coming up with the plan and the one and three. 
I have sat on numerous stakeholder processes to coach the multi-species and currently sit on two advisory processes for different species management in Oregon. Hundreds of thousands of anglers support science-based management. And this one in three is based in science, contrary to what we're hearing from a lot of our other folks. So I could go on for hours. I think you all know me uh, that I can be wordy, but there's no one more passionate than a harvest jangler about conservation. Without our species, do we harvest? So I really would, ex would respectfully submit to the to the commissioners that the one in three is a conservative bag limit and should be adopted by rule. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. Um, Sophia Kalki, and then uh, Michael McLean and Joe Rudder, and we're waiting for um, George Grinsowitz, I believe is his name. Sophia, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sophia Kelke, and I live in Bend, Oregon. I work for Trout Unlimited as our Oregon Engagement Manager and represent our 4,000 Trout Unlimited members here in Oregon and our 30 plus members and supporters of our Wild Steelhead Initiative. Climate change and other pressures, including fishing, have contributed to a steady and in some cases, dramatic decline in wild steelhead populations across their native range. Steelhead fishing regulations in the rogue South Coast region should reflect this reality and the fact that there are large gaps in scientific data on population and age class numbers. Without adequate population estimates, harvest rates, and overall population mortality, the continued harvest of wild steelhead poses far too much uncertainty and implements excessive risk to populations in Southern Oregon. To manage this fishery proactively, I ask that the commission votes to increase the winter steelhead conservation status threshold for decision 3.2, but I also want to reiterate that simply raising the threshold is not enough to address the gaps in data needed to properly manage this fishery. By solely raising the conservation threshold, we are essentially waiting for the juvenile abundance and half pounder indexes to drop before action is taken. The Rogue River has experienced the six lowest years on record for juvenile abundance in the last six years. Climate change is decreasing our ability to predict trends in abundance and productivity. These factors, in addition to the massive data gaps, indic indicate that retro retroactive management, like solely raising the thresholds, is not enough. Until we have more data, I ask on behalf of Trout Unlimited that the commission votes in favor of alternative two catch and release of wild winter steelhead for decision 3.1. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Sophia. Um, we'll keep going with Michael um, McLean and then Joe Rudder and Sean Connors, who was earlier um, is back. So we will do him next. So Michael McLean and Joe Rudder, then Sean Connors. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melchair. My name is Michael McLean, and I'm testifying before you today as a born and raised Oregonian to express my interest in changing angling regulations to require catch and release of all wild steelhead in Southern Oregon rivers. I'm a graduate of Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science degree specializing in fisheries and wildlife management. I've also been working as a guide in the sport fishing industry since 2005 and have held a guides license in Oregon, Alaska, and British Columbia. To think harvesting wild steelhead is even being deliberated on today is a shame. Today, numbers of wild steelhead throughout their historic range is dismal at best, even in the, quote, best rivers. This year, from Southern Oregon to Northern British Columbia, we collectively saw the worst steelhead runs ever documented. This led to emergency closures to protect the few adults that remain, a fact that I'm sure was not lost on any of you. Knowing how fragile wild steelhead populations have become and that many are teetering on the brink of extinction, how can ODFW, who has been tasked with managing and protecting these vulnerable and valuable fish, still allow them to be harvested? Simply put, there is not sufficient data on the population dynamics of wild steelhead at different life stages in these Southern Oregon streams to know what impact wild fish harvest will have on their populations. ODF is flirting with disaster to allow continued harvest of wild steelhead. Beyond not having enough evidence to support a wild steelhead harvest, doesn't it just seem wrong? Why is Southern Oregon the only region of the steelhead range that still allows for steel wild steelhead harvest? Seems a bit outdated and draconian. 
considering many of these streams already have hatcheries present and the slew of negative impacts that hatcheries have been shown to have on wild populations. It seems that allowing wild harvest to continue is akin to kicking wild steelhead stocks while they are down. Changing angling regulations to require wild steelhead be released until further data is collected is the smartest and safest move ODFW can make. If the goal at ODFW is truly, and I quote, to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations, quote, then this debate seems like a classic no-brainer. Please do the right thing, respect and release wild steelhead. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michael. We'll go to Sean Connors, Joe Rutter, and then Peter Tronquet. Okay, Joe Rutter or Sean Connors, are either of you ready? Uh, yes, uh, Joe Rutter is. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Joe Rutter. I live in Port Townsend, Washington, and I love coming down to the Rogue River and the South Coast watersheds uh, for steelhead fishing. I've taken very memorable fishing trips there and hope to keep coming back, most lately uh, with my son as well. After hearing of this current situation to continue allowing harvest of wild winter steelhead on the Rogan South Coast watersheds, I felt that I should voice my opinion on the situation. Steelhead face many obstacles as a species at this day and age, and they keep mounting up year after year as their habitat declines, ocean conditions become worse due to climate change and overharvest continues to occur. Each year, the return numbers are becoming less and less across the board. Steelhead can't keep facing more troubling obstacles, especially if they are obstacles within our immediate control that we can change for the better. The October draft of the Rogue and South Coast Rivers plan is proposing wild steelhead harvest without sufficient population estimates, harvest rates, and overall population mortality. To put it simply, this draft does not sound accurate enough with sufficient data to allow the harvest of these rivers and is putting way too much risk on wild steelhead populations in Southern Oregon. As a solution to this situation, I request that the commission direct ODFW and the powers that be to adopt catch and release regulations to these watersheds and that ODFW, ODFW provide adequate management data and monitoring with adult steelhead population estimates, escapement goals and expect, expected fisheries mortality before allowing harvest. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of these species I'm so passionate about. I hope that the catch and release regulations will be implemented for wild winter steelhead on the Rogue and South Coast watersheds and that ODFW will start collecting the proper accurate data so steps can be made to ensure a healthy abundance of wild steelhead in these special rivers for the future and that our future generations like my son may enjoy fishing for these rivers too for years and years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. We'll go to Peter Tronquet and then Sean Connors if he's here. And if not, then we'll go, we'll try one more time for George Grinzowicz and then um, Eleazar Tubianosa. So Peter and then Sean. And I think we have Peter only by sound, not also by video. Peter or Peter Tronke or Sean Connors? Or George Grinzowitz? Mary, Peter is not in the room. Sean is not in the room. What was okay. the last name that you just read off? George Grinzowitz. And George is not in the room. Okay. Then, Chair, Wall, Chair Wall, if I might just interject here, we- sure. We have a number of folks who are in the attendee side that have not, that we've not been able to move into the panelist side. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to reassure those folks that when we get through the list here, we will, we will pause to try and solve our technical issues with that small number of folks that we've not been able to accommodate yet. Thank you, and I'll look. I'll ask you for. I don't see that list, but so maybe we can go through who's here, and then you see the list of the people that are still in attendee. Um, Chair Wall, I, I 
I just see them in the I just see them in the chat saying that they're still here, but they haven't been able to testify yet. Got it. Okay, then um, the people that whose names are on the list that I see that are all ready to testify are um, Conrad Gowell, Elizabeth Perkins, Jeremiah Hool. So let's do those three people if we can: um, Conrad, Elizabeth. Jeremiah Hool, and then we'll keep going through the list and trying to get people over. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Go ahead, Conrad. Thank you, uh, Chair Wall, Director Melcher, and members of the commission. My name is Conrad Gowell, and I am from McMinnville, Oregon. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. There are just three points I want to make. First, an unlimited number of people catching and releasing steelhead can be just as impactful, if not more so, than an unlimited number of people we're able to catch and kill steelhead. Eliminating one of these user groups will not solve the systemic issue of being unable to limit take from the other. Widening the division between non-consumptive and consumptive user groups will only serve to fracture the communities that care about these fish. While closures should be considered when warranted, I would not wade into the shifting out allocation between these differing values while we need to focus on the systemic issues surrounding our collective relationship. Two, I want to acknowledge that these rivers and fisheries were managed since time immemorial by indigenous people. I have heard no mention of, and I don't have time to go into the broken treaties, unkept promises, and forced exclusion of indigenous peoples from their first foods. If I was a commissioner making the decision, I would not cast a vote for their obstructed responsible cultural fishing practices. I certainly wouldn't want to force tribal communities to rely only on hatchery fish and the few rivers they are forced into for their only means of subsistence and spiritual connection. There is such little data and a true risk of extinction. Truly this cultural fishing legacy is something to prioritize. And the third and last, having bought a fishing license for 23 state years in Oregon, since I was 12 years old, I main, mainly participated in catch and release steelhead fisheries. Lately, I'm questioning whether I will fish this next year. I am taking seriously the don't play with your food message I have received from tribal elders. Instead, I've taken to underwater photography for fearing a need to document these fish for future generations that may not have the opportunity to encounter them. When I received the public records request of the catch card data that precipitated the formation of this plan, I was made painfully aware of how broken that method of assessing species health is, and it depresses me And as it continues to be the only way fishing is regulated. Director Melcher did give me hope though. I've heard about big game management being applied to salmon and steelhead for decades, but his comment at the last meeting was the first time I've seen it seriously considered in the policy setting context. I want to applaud him for his leadership and hope that you'll realize the significance of that transformational vision, not only for Southern Oregon, um, but all of the fisheries of the state. Thank you for considering my comments and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Conrad. Um, so Jeremiah Houle and then Elizabeth Perkins. Uh, Chair Wall and Commissioners, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm sure you're happy to see all of our pretty faces again. So I'm a former guide for over a dozen years, and I currently work on the wholesale fishing product side for uh, the fishing industry in Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. Um, I get a really unique look into the money that flows into individual communities that are surrounded by steelhead rivers. Supporting, uh, sporting goods stores near rivers with closures, uh, as you guys all know, uh, have been hit very hard past uh, past year. Add that with the uh, lower steelhead returns that we've had um, and these once prosperous towns, Mop in Oregon, um, Glide, Oregon, all these places uh, have been really struggling. So um, within that, I speak to them on a daily basis and places that have catch and release practices for wild steelhead, those businesses and those communities are doing great. Um, you know, Forks, Washington, I think is a prime example of that. They closed all retention for wild fish and you go there now and the place is booming. So uh, the money that flows outward from a steelhead river is immense, but I think it hinges heavily on the experience, not the kill. So uh, the status quo has not worked across the entire West Coast in each place where everyone said everything was great. Um, now look, we've got closures on some of the most famous watersheds. So three years ago, I don't think anyone would have predicted the closure of the North Umpqua River, the Deschutes River, um, yet here we are in 2021 with, with those rivers being closed. So the one wild steelhead per day, three wild steelhead for the season doesn't have limitations uh, for the number of anglers. So if you 
you know, have a deer or elk season, we're able to limit the number of tags with, with wild steel, we don't. So if a million people buy a fishing license, a million people go down there, we're going to have a million people able, able to take one steelhead per day, three per season. Um, I support alternative two catch and release for wild steelhead in the Southern Oregon zone. Please keep as many hatchery fish as you're legally allowed to keep. Um, there's plenty of them down there for you. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Jeremiah. Elizabeth Perkin, go ahead. Chair Wall, members of the commission, Director Melcher. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Perkin. I'm the Northern Oregon Regional Coordinator for the Native Fish Society. Native Fish Society is asking the commission adopt option two of the proposed Rogue and South Coast plan, which would not allow the take of wild steelhead until adequate monitoring is in place and five years of sufficient monitoring data have been collected. We would like to remind the commission that ODFW has officially adopted the precautionary principle in both its climate change policy and as a key element of the native fish conservation policy. The precautionary principle has four central components, taking preventative action in the face of uncertainty, shifting the burden of proof to the proponents of an activity, exploring a wide range of alternatives to possibly harmful actions and increasing public participation in decision-making. A rapidly changing climate means we are in, in facing increasing uncertainty, not only of environmental conditions, but also how steelhead with their amazingly diverse and complex life histories will respond to those changes. At the very least, five years of accurate baseline data of adult spawning numbers and angling impact impacts is needed in all watersheds before the harvest of wild steelhead can be allowed. This past summer, steelhead fishing was closed in the Deschutes, John Day, and North Umpqua rivers. Those closures have been characterized by some as precautionary, but the reality is that those closures took place in response to record low runs that have been in decline for five years. A precautionary approach to managing those fisheries would have introduced increased regulations on them more four years ago when a pattern of decline was first evident. We implore the commission to not make the same mistake in the Rogue and South Coast plan. Instead, we ask, ask that the commission to apply the precautionary principle in wild steelhead management and select option two, limiting wild steelhead angling to catch and release and implementing adequate monitoring. As it currently stands, limiting wild steelhead angling to catch and release in the Rogue and South Coast is the best management option for wild steelhead. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the next people that we have on the list, actually, you know, what, I, what I'd like to do is read the names that I have left and see if we can get any of these people into the room. Um, we have Harvey Young, Peter Tronquet, Sean Connors, George Grinzowitz, Eliezer Tubianosa, Austin Helmer, Dan Gates, Matthew Lund, and um, he, we have a name that's listed as committee to elect heap, but I think that means rich, rich heap, I'm not sure. So let's, it looks like Peter Tronquet is ready and let me know if I am missing anybody, if those of you who are panelists know of others that are still waiting to testify. So Peter Tronquet, go ahead. Sure, well, I've been in the, been in the room or I've, I've been on the, you know, been on the participating in the video, but I, I finally got admitted. So Michelle, thank you for that. My name is Peter Tronquet. I live on, uh, I live on the mid coast of Oregon, just across the bridge from Newport. I'd like to go on a little bit different tack here because I've been a stakeholder on three different conservation plans. The one I'd like to talk about is uh, the Rogue SMU Fall Chinook Plan. And the reason I'm doing that is because ODFW, to my surprise, I wasn't expecting it, um, all of a sudden shoehorned that into uh, the RS, uh, the Winter Steelhead Plan that we've been working on and testifying today. I didn't understand why that was the case, but I understand more about it now. So I'd like to remind the commission why, why that's a dangerous thing to do. So first of all, as a stakeholder, you've got... Oh, Peter, Peter, we've lost audio for you. Michelle, do you know what's going on with that one? Okay. You don't hear me? Now I do again, sorry. It, it was just gone for a minute. So you were just talking about the fall Chinook plan. Yes. And so in attach, shoehorned into the RSP plan is an effort to put fall Chinook, hatchery fall Chinook into the Winshock River. And I'm here to tell you that that was never approved by the stakeholder group on the Fall Chinook plan, 
nor was it approved by the commission. That was always a wild fish river. So if there's an effort on the commission's part to create a hybrid type of plan that includes Chinook, which I, which I think is a bad plan, a bad idea, but if it is, then you have to remove uh, the wild or the, the mixed fish emphasis area from the Winchuck River if you decide to create a hybrid plan. So, you know, that's something that under the uh, commission's pur purview, and you can do that, I guess, if you want. But to me, uh, it's it's setting a precedent and showing no confidence in the work that's been done on the on the Rogue Falls Chinook SMU plan. So. Uh, at any rate, if, wherever you go, make sure that if you want to be consistent with what we said in the in the rogue SMU Falls Chinook plan, you have to make sure that the windchuck is a wild fish emphasis area. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, five one. Michelle, can you tell me who else is waiting to testify mm -hmm. and available? I have Richard Heap, Matthew Lund, and Harvey Young available. Let's go in that order. Richard Heap, Matthew Lund, Harvey Young. Go ahead, Richard. Um, Chair Wall, 5-1. I apologize for the confusion over my name. My uh, Zoom thing auto-populates that a lot, so I, I'm one of five identities. But I would like to echo what uh, you just heard from Peter Tronquet. I also served on that committee. Um, and I would ask that you do not include Chinook salmon in this plan or in any part of the plan, especially as the discussion goes with uh, wild fish emphasis areas. We discussed that in the plan, it's covered in the plan. And if you blend the two, you're gonna create some confusion between the plan. So I'd ask you to make sure that salmon are not included. Um, we just give him his jug. We have heard an awful lot of testimonies based on, on a motion today. Um, it could be in here, but I from have folks about catch and release and the benefit the wild steel had. I would point out to you that um, most of what I've heard is speculative and not based on any data. We have an opportunity in Southern Oregon right now, if we retain a limited harvest program and couple that with much more vigorous uh, survey and inventory or investigations by the department, we can actually try and get some sort of a test uh, to see whether or not the harvest of wild, limited harvest of wild steelhead actually has any impact on steelhead population. I would point out with some irony that the uh, flagship steelhead streams that have been working under a mandatory catch and release proposal or program for several years are closed this year. And yet we have the Rogue and the Chetco, which have a limited opportunity open. So my guess is that uh, catch and release has virtually no impact on steelhead populations. It is habitat driven at the beginning, at the end, in any way you want to cut it. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. Let's go to Matthew Lund and then Harvey Young, and then we'll check who else is left. Matthew? Hi. Go ahead. Could you unmute yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Matt and I want to support uh, catch and release on the South Coast. Um, I go down to the South Coast a lot to adventure and to fish and I am highly concerned with as other rivers collapse, um, people are going to start coming down more and more and I'm one of them. Um, and I live in McMinnville and I go down there often to fish and things change with time, right? Um, so if you all of a sudden have a lot of uh, fisheries closed around the Portland area, people are gonna start coming down more and more to the South Coast to fish, um, cause that's where the fish are at. And you'll just kind of keep seeing what's been happening all over the, the Pacific Northwest, you know. Uh, first it was uh, the, the, you know, the Olympic Peninsula was untouchable. It was really remote and isolated, but now it's just a touch away from Seattle and, and all the other urban areas. And uh, that's kind of what people are seeing, you know, on the South Coast is that uh, people are starting to travel and, and fisheries are getting um, uh, constrained per se. And, and with that comes change. And I think when you have that, you need to go the most conservative, conservative way. And in my mind for now, with the options presented, that's a catch and release fishery. Um, I really love going down there. I spend a lot of time there and I love the place and I'd hate to see rivers close there as well. So 
that's all I have to say. Sorry, I ran here. I just got in the door from from uh, my car. <laughs> so <laughs> I made it. For, thank you for hanging with us and testifying. Oh, yeah. um, then we'll go to so Harvey much. Young. Good afternoon, Harvey Young here. You can hear me, I suppose. We can, Harvey, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Director Melcher, Chair Wall and Commissioners. My name is Harvey Young. I'm a resident of Jackson County in the Southwest Zone. I've guided for 50 years and enjoyed most of that time. The reason I'm here to speak to the commission today and the public is I really believe and have experienced from being on the ground fishing clients on these rivers in question that our steelhead runs are not what they were 20 years ago. And after hearing staff talk about climate change and the future, I think it's an alert for us. I'm not a huge proponent on climate change, but I'm also a bait guy. I use steelhead eggs to catch steelhead. I have used flies to catch steelhead. I'm not opposed to catch and release. I think it's an issue we need to deal with here in the future. And I appreciate your time. Um, so you know that I am for catch and release as well as many of the other guides and friendships I've developed in the last 50 years of guiding. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Harvey. Um, I would check with Michelle or, or Director Melcher or others. I don't see other people who are on the list to testify who are here in the room and available. So if we're missing something, if you can let us know or let Michelle know. Mary, the easiest um, way to identify that would be is if someone has not had an opportunity, use the raise hand function so that we can identify you easily. Just to repeat, if you haven't had a chance to speak, we would love to see your hand as a raised hand so we can identify you and, and hear from you. And Chair Wall and Michelle, I do note that Shandy Danford is still on the list and I don't believe I uh, they ever got a chance to speak. She didn't, but there was a chat message from her that said she had to leave. Oh, okay. Yes. She's still, so, on, she's still on the list, but okay. Unfortunately, we missed her. Um, Commissioner Spellbrink, you have your hand up. Is there, do you have somebody that wants to speak? No, I just wanted clarification. Like uh, Peter Tronquet and Richard Heap, I based, I'm, so they were for alternative two on decision one. Is that right? The designations only apply to species covered by the RSP on the wild fish emphasis area and mixed emphasis area. I don't know that they're available still to answer, but what I heard was that they wanted it not to apply to the wind chuck. I didn't, I didn't hear. So if they're still, a, they should answer that if they're still here. Can you hear me, Commissioner Spilbrink? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you repeat your question? Okay. On so on the uh, the wild fish emphasis areas and the mixed emphasis areas. Uh, would, were you for either alternative one or alternative two? I'm for alternative two. That's what I, that's what I assume. That's what it sounded. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Other, do we have anyone else left to testify? Uh, Sean Connors is Sean Connors is now available. Go ahead, Sean. And and Michelle, is there somebody else that you have that you know of? Nope. Sean was the one that I saw also. Okay. I'm so sorry for all the technical difficulties. Uh, I had to switch over to my phone. So my apologies. Um, so Terrell commissioners, thank you so much for hearing us all today. Um, it's been really awesome hearing um, all of these great thoughts on the matter. Um, my name is Sean Connors. Um, I live in Grants Pass, Oregon. Um, I grew up here, um, so I feel the need to testify um, that because of this, uh, fishing on the Rogue and many other fisheries in Southern Oregon that I know the impact uh, that these fish have on not only me, 
uh, but my friends and family who travel here uh, to fish for these amazing, amazing fish. Um, I've also spent a large amount of time on the rivers such as the Deschutes um, and North Umpqua, um, and I'm disappointed uh, that what you know this happened this year, but I'm not surprised um, at all. I mean, this is a is a growing trend. Um, we've all witnessed the wild winter steelhead across the West Coast have been dealt a series of overwhelming issues ranging from climate change to habitat loss. Um, in particular, um, there and, and there's also little data on wild fish population estimates um, or how many fish are being kept every year. Despite this, the October draft of the Rogue South Coast Conservation Management Plan proposes wild steelhead harvest without having any of these statistics. Not only that, but the ability to harvest these fish will be placed on top of the fact that the Rogue and Chetco um, provide a fantastic opportunity to retain these fish, um, which I do. Um, so there's a, there's a great opportunity there. Based on what we have in terms of data, I request that the data or request that the catch and release regulations are placed until the necessary collection of this data is implemented um, before we allow for the retention of wild steelhead. ODFW should implement basic monitoring of wild steelhead population estimates, as well as get a more accurate idea of expected mortality rate uh, for winter steelhead. I really appreciate a chance to share my thoughts today. Um, and look forward to the adoption of uh, catch and release regulations. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sean. Any last people that we have not yet um, heard from who are still here? Then I think it might be time to thank the people who were able to testify, apologize to the people we didn't get to hear from who tried to get, get heard in this process, Please be assured that we have um, listened to the people who were talking today and hopefully your comments would be reflected in what you heard from others. Um, but a huge thanks to those who testified, stayed with us, to the commissioners, to staff for making this all possible. And um, unless there's anything else, I think we are adjourned for today. So thank you all, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.